There are many miles of undiscovered areas beneath the crust we can't even come close to. Scientists found what appears to be underground mountains buried inside the mantle. Our planet is divided into three layers, the crust, the mantle, and the core. The crust is where 8 billion people, trillions of trees, and millions of animals live and thrive. There are also different types of crust in the land and the ocean. The oceanic crust contains unique rocks and is denser than the land crust. We all see how the Earth is divided and color-coded to show the crust, mantle, and core in textbooks. But there are also special layers in between that not everyone talks about. The mantle is divided into the upper and lower part, which is the transition zone. Since the mantle acts as the geological recycling center, the plate tectonics don't only move side to side, but up and down. It's actually why all the volcanoes appeared. The magma spews out to the surface or even underwater and then sinks back down and repeats. The transitions go down 250 miles and then 410 miles. And in this bottom layer, scientists keep discovering the hidden landscapes. The mountains in the mantle are more rugged and much larger than the ones on the crust. Scientists found a mountain range with peaks higher than Mount Everest. Some of them are as high as 600 miles. When the continents were still landlocked together, there may have been some hidden lands now underwater. Theories suggest that Iceland used to be part of a larger microcontinent, Icelandia, which connected present-day Iceland with Greenland and Scandinavia. The idea digs even deeper to a greater Icelandia, which includes Britain. But after the split, these bigger lands sunk with everything in it. There are also theories about New Zealand being part of Zealandia, a hidden microcontinent within the same region. So it could be that these mountains used to be part of old Earth that are underground over the billions of years of natural occurrences. But still, it isn't very likely. One theory is that these underground mountain ranges could be leftover slabs of rock that descended from the surface to the transition zone from the moving of the tectonic plates. As they sink, the large pieces break down into smaller ones, and as they compile over the millions of years, they form what appears to be underground mountains. Since the mantle is the geologic recycling zone, it's likely that the rocks down there used to be part of the surface. They weren't large pieces of land that got hidden, just like dogs hide bones in the garden. But it takes way more time to hide mountains. Some parts of the mantle appear to be smooth, while others aren't so much. The parts that have a cluster of rocks could contain hidden elements in the underground mountains. The smoother parts don't have much seismic or volcanic activity, while the rough parts do. The best way to study those underground landscapes is to wait for an earthquake or a volcano eruption to happen. Seismologists can observe the Earth's interior with special scanners, just like doctors use ultrasound to examine a patient. They can even see minor details and not huge chunks of rocks. A strong enough earthquake can send shockwaves to the Earth's interior, even through the core and back up to the surface. Depending on where they occur, Seismologists can observe and study the intensity of the waves as they move back and forth. On smooth rocks, the waves can travel in a straight line, but once they reach a rough area, the waves tend to scatter. The temperature and composition of the materials can make the waves move faster or slower. But this info isn't exactly accurate and won't contribute a lot to the actual data of the underground mountains. So by analyzing the scattered waves on ships, and utilizing the Earth's magnetic field, scientists can figure out everything they need to know. But these studies are only good enough to figure out the interior in today's state, not how the Earth changed over the past 4.5 billion years. However, scientists are certain that mantle material still dates back to the beginning of Earth's original formation. The question, why not just dig a hole to the center of the Earth and see what's going on down there, might seem logical. The deepest hole humans have dug so far is the Kola Deep Borehole in the Russian Arctic that goes more than 40,000 feet deep. The locals claim they can actually hear screaming coming from below. It took almost 20 years to drill as far as they went. 
but it's literally merely scratching the surface of what's underneath. They dug about one third of the crust, which is only 0.2% to the center of the Earth. Getting there is beyond us, just like trying to reach the sun. No human can handle the amount of pressure down there. Going down the Mariana Trench, the Earth's deepest point, requires special gear to withstand all the immense pressure. It'll cost a fortune to build that tech to get us to the center of our planet. Evidence of diamonds buried deep in Brazil shows that everything we do on the crust's surface can affect things miles below, even towards the mantle. Scientists dug up six diamonds that could hold tiny mineral grains. As they're called in the mineral world, these inclusions have a chemistry composition where they originated deep in the Earth. Typical diamonds are formed at depths less than 125 miles in the upper mantle, where it's extremely hot. The high pressure and boiling temperature down crystallizes carbon and creates diamonds. But humans can't dig all the way down there. They mine them by detecting where a deep volcanic eruption happened that expelled these diamonds to the surface. These eruptions occurred millions of years ago, when dinosaurs used to rule the Earth. They shot out the diamonds that were in the mantle and are now embedded within the cooled down volcanic material. That's where people mine them. But these special diamonds found in Brazil originated from a much deeper point than usual, which can further help scientists study the depths of the Earth. They can extract these inclusions and analyze them in a lab to tell where exactly these minerals come from. In the lab, scientists study inclusions, each just 15 to 40 microns wide, less than a quarter width of a human hair. They found out that they contained many types of minerals found in volcanic rock on the surface. The carbon composition of the magma from the surface is much different than the ones deep in the Earth. What's crazy is that these diamonds with special inclusions can only be found 435 miles in the lower mantle. With only a few samples of them found, we don't know what else lies beneath us. It's possible that those mountain ranges underground, taller than Mount Everest, can have traces of diamonds all around, which would prompt excavators to dig them up and saturate the market with them. These diamonds are less flawed than the usual ones and might even come in many sizes. It's possible to see diamonds as large as a car or as small as a grain of rice. There might even be new diamonds with different chemical compositions than the ones we find near the surface. The largest diamond in the world is the Cullinan, which can fit in the palm of your hand. It weighs around 1.3 pounds and is 3,100 carats. It was found in 1905 in South Africa. For anything to exist on Earth, you need carbon. In a nutshell, the carbon cycle is when plants and algae release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere or dissolved in water through photosynthesis. It's converted into carbohydrates and stored as fat. Later on, carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere through breathing, which the plants benefit from, and the cycle goes on. Scientists claim that there might even be a carbon cycle in Earth's interior. The oceanic crust has a lot of carbon sediment that could mix with the upper and lower mantle layer. But there still isn't enough evidence to support this. The deep diamonds might be the key to popping open that theory. Only time will tell. Only true adventure enthusiasts and experts dare to climb the K2 mountain. And even for them, returning safely is not a given. You can find this peak in the middle of the Karakora mountain range in northern Pakistan. It was the second one measured during a survey in 1856. That's why it's got a weird name. K2 Mountain is 28,000 feet above sea level. This makes it the second highest mountain on Earth right after Mount Everest. It's also among the most dangerous places. Out of the top five highest mountains globally, K2 is the most dangerous, claiming one life for every four people who reach the top. Avalanches, crazy storms, and tricky slopes make K2 the toughest mountain to climb on the planet. The air is thin. Only one-third of the oxygen you can find at sea level is up there on the K2 summit. Storms can last for days, causing lots of trouble. K2 might be a tad shorter than Mount Everest, but it's way harder to climb because of its terrain. Everest has some flat stretches, but K2 is steep almost all the way up. At 24,000 feet, it flattens out a little. 
But rock falls and unpredictable weather make this area a real risk zone. Everest might be taller, but K2 is considered more lethal. Everest has a couple of popular routes, like the South Coal and the North Ridge. K2, on the other hand, doesn't believe in easy routes. Even the supposedly simple one is steep as heck, averaging 45 degrees from base to summit. While Everest has spots where climbers can chill out, K2 doesn't play that game. Campsites on K2 are tiny compared to those on Everest, and things get wild as you climb higher. On Everest, climbers might sometimes ditch their helmets, especially on less intense sections. But on K2, you better keep that helmet on from the get-go. Rocks are falling, avalanches are happening, safety first. Rescues are a whole different story on K2. The rocky terrain makes it tough to bring down an injured climber. Helicopters aren't readily available, and even if you get one, it's going to cost you a pretty penny. Everest is a bit friendlier in that department. These Nepalese climbers are a big deal on Everest, but not so much on K2. Sherpas are like the superheroes of Everest, helping climbers speed up the ascent. On K2, it's a bit more of a solo mission. Now, let's talk about danger zones. The Kumba Icefall on Everest is gnarly, but K2's bottleneck takes the cake. It's higher, which makes it way riskier. And here's the kicker. There have been years when nobody has reached K2's summit. That's not a thing on Everest. Success rates on Everest are a lot higher. The first attempt to reach the summit was made in 1902 by a team of climbers, but they only got to 21,400 feet. Only in 1954 did an Italian crew with a Pakistani buddy in tow finally conquer K2. That was no easy feat. By August 2022, only around 700 people had reached the top. At least 91 people have lost their lives trying to conquer the peak. Moving on to other extreme places on Earth, like Ethiopia's Danakil Depression. At first glance, it looks like another planet, for example, Mars. Its landscape is a mix of burning salt, volcanic rock, and sulfuric acid, all in shades of yellow and orange. There are springs with bad vibes around the Dalo volcano, one of the many volcanoes in the area. Scientists have recently examined samples from these pools, hoping to find signs of life. But no luck. The DNA levels in these springs are basically non-existent. This makes the Danakil Depression one of the least friendly places for life on our planet. The next extreme zone is Death Valley, California. It's among the hottest spots on our planet. You can cook eggs on the ground there. The highest temperature ever recorded by a weather station in that area was 134 degrees Fahrenheit in 1913. Keep in mind that there's an even hotter ground spot on our planet. It's in the Dashilut Desert in Iran. A NASA satellite measured a temperature of 159 degrees Fahrenheit there in 2005. It's so blazing hot that birds flying through that area sometimes drop from the sky because they can't handle the intense heat. So let's switch from heat to humidity, because we're going to a village called Masanram in India. This place is the rain champion of the world. It's got so much rain in a year that if you put Rio de Janeiro's Christ the Redeemer, that huge 98-foot tall statue there, it would be standing in knee-deep water. This village is in the Kashi Hills. It has 467 inches of rainfall every year. It's like stacking 39 standard cereal boxes, one on top of the other, over the course of a year. Our next one is La Oroya. Living in this city in central Peru is really tough for the 25,000 people calling this place home. The air is filled with dangerous stuff like arsenic, lead, and sulfur dioxide. Even rain is acidic, wrecking local plants. In La Oroya, there's a metal factory that makes things like gold, silver, and cadmium. That factory is the main job provider in the city. Yet, in 2007, experts said that this place was one of the most polluted spots on Earth. People are working hard to clean up the mess and make life better there. Tristan da Cunha in the South Atlantic is the most isolated spot on Earth. It's a tiny bunch of islands with just 246 people living there. There's no place to land a plane. If you want to visit or leave, you're in for a boat ride. 
It's a six-day journey all the way from South Africa, about 15 to 1700 miles away. Now, probably the most dangerous place to spend your life is the Pacific Islands of Vanuatu. You would be living life on the edge, dodging volcanoes, earthquakes, and tsunamis every day. UN's World Risk Index classifies this place as the riskiest spot to call home. Satellite data says sea levels around Vanuatu have been rising by about 6 millimeters every year since 1993. Plus, in April 2020, the island got smacked by Tropical Cyclone Harold, the worst in five years, with harsh winds hitting up to 155 miles per hour. Our next one is a place where loads of people are crammed into a tiny space. Manila in the Philippines has an estimated 184,570 people packed into every square mile. Manila is that crowded because of the city's economic growth in the past 50 years, mostly thanks to its bustling port. More money and jobs mean more people moving in. With people comes pollution and traffic jams, which turn life there into an everyday struggle. Oh, and finding a place to live in Manila is like searching for a needle in a haystack. A massive housing shortage adds even more chaos to the mix. Yakuts in Russia claims the crown for being the city with the lowest winter temperatures. In 1891, it hit minus 83.9 degrees Fahrenheit. It isn't the coldest place on Earth, though. The eastern Antarctic plateau in Antarctica holds that record with minus 137 degrees Fahrenheit. Yakuts is the coldest city in the world for a few reasons. Firstly, it's far from the sea, with no warm ocean influences. Secondly, a high-pressure system brings frigid air from the Arctic during winter. Sunlight is a rare sight in Yakuts during winter. The city sits on continuous permafrost, meaning the ground is always frozen, too. Around 355,000 people call Yakuts home. What's surprising is that this spot cranks up the heat in the summer. In July, the average high temperature reaches 79 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hotter than in London during the same season. Well, that's some wacky weather, huh? The coldest part of our planet, Antarctica, keeps surprising us. Take a look at this waterfall named Blood Falls. Reddish water falls from the white ice. Scientists concluded that the color is related to iron. The water coming from the glacier oxidizes and rusts when it's exposed to oxygen, and the red color occurs. Step on Mount Gandic. It lays eggs. Well, maybe not real eggs, but the stones certainly look like dinosaur eggs. That's why the mountain got its fame. The, let's call them stone eggs, formed in one part of the mountain over 500 million years ago. Interestingly, this phenomenon repeats once every 30 years. Eggs come out in various sizes and shades. The stones appear on the surface of the cliff. A study made in the area has revealed that the composition of the stones of the cliff isn't similar to other parts of the mountain. Here, calcareous rocks rule. They're more prone to erosion. They ripen off day by day. It took three decades for the stones to get to the egg shape. Yet, it's still a mystery how these rock formations can be so perfectly spherical and smooth. According to scientists, every stone egg has an organic core. They're made of shells, plant remains, fish teeth, and skeletons. Maybe this has something to do with it. Gulu Village is close to the stone eggs. Locals believe that these eggs are sacred. Villagers associate it with good fortune. In fact, nearly every family has one of these eggs in their house. Unfortunately, there are only about 70 eggs left, so if you want to see them, you gotta hurry up. The Rich Hat structure is a circular geological phenomenon in the Sahara Desert near Mauritania. It's made out of rocks in layers, and these layers look very much like rings. No wonder the unique structure even got NASA's attention. Up from the sky, the geological feature seems to be swirling and spinning. Scientists are still not sure how these rings got there. Some say it was an asteroid impact. Many others believe that it was a natural geological process. To them, the Rich Hat structure is an uplifted and eroded dome. Geologists often classify it as a domed anticline. The scientists discovered that the rocks at the center are older than the ring-shaped outer rocks. 
so it seems like the stones have been eroded to flat rock layers. Anyway, there's no valid explanation for this phenomenon, and the 28-mile-long mystery of the Sahara is still to be solved. Number 4 is Rapa Nui, or Isla de Pasqua, but I bet you know it as Easter Island. Yeah, it's got three names. It was discovered by Jacob Rogovine, who actually never intended to look for that island. He just casually landed there one Sunday. That's where the name comes from. Jacob was supposed to find Terra Australis. Disclaimer, it's not Australia. This one never existed and was nothing but a hypothetical continent. Plus, he wanted to peek at Davis Land, which was believed to have once been seen by Edward Davis, the pirate, not Edward Davis the saxophone player. Jacob failed at that too, though nobody ever saw that island except for the pirate Davis. Jacob may have failed to discover some lands he wanted to, but he discovered Easter Island instead. This is an island and special territory of Chile, located in the southeastern Pacific Ocean. It's on my list because nearly 1,000 stone statues called Moai were found there. They were created by the Rapa Nui people. Nearly all statues represent gigantic heads, but there are also a small number of figures kneeling with their hands over their stomachs. Each statue represented chiefs or other important members of Easter Island society. To curve those statues, the locals used volcanic stones that were softened. Our next stop is the gateway to the underworld. Nah, don't worry. This is just how people labeled Darvaza gas crater in Turkmenistan. This giant natural gas crater has been there for five decades. This crater is continuously burning gases. The president of the country wants experts to find a way to extinguish this continuous firing pit. This site was created by people accidentally in 1971 while working on a natural gas project. Ever since then, the flames have been on and it's become a tourist attraction. Mysterious constructions are sometimes built in our era, too. We don't have to go millions of years ago to long-gone civilizations. Edward Leach Scollin single-handedly built a structure called Coral Castle in Homestead, Florida. He didn't use any large machinery. He carved and sculpted more than 1,100 tons of coral rock in 28 years until 1951. It's a mystery how he managed to do it all by himself. Leedskallen sculpted the sedimentary rock into different objects, such as walls, tables, chairs, a fountain, and a sundial. There's, of course, a legend behind this mystery, too. He was inspired to build the structure after being abandoned by his fiancée on their wedding day. Uh Uh-oh, runaway bride! Well, he wanted to prove his love to her and the world, so he wanted to do something extraordinary. Well, he definitely nailed it! Now, let's talk a little bit about the mystery of the Namibian fairy circles. There are millions of circular patches in hundreds of miles, ranging from 10 to 65 feet in diameter. They're called fairy circles because they look like a fairy or an otherworldly creature made them. These are essentially oval-shaped soil surrounded by grass. There are a lot of local beliefs surrounding the creator of these marks, yet science says something else. Biologists and mathematicians have been puzzled by the mystery of the Namibian fairy circles for decades. There is more than one theory to explain this phenomenon. Here's one popular theory. The water is limited in the desert, so plants compete to reach the water. Some plants expand and thrive into a patch, but smaller plants nearby cannot get the necessary water to live. In the end, some vegetation disappears, and the remaining ones stay at the patch's edges. That's why they form such regular distant gaps. What if I tell you that there is a hill in Leh City, India, where, instead of rolling downwards, things roll uphill? It's an optical illusion. The road looks like it's a sloping hill because of its surrounding landscapes, yet the road actually goes down. These kinds of hills are called magnetic hills or gravity hills. Scientific explanations vary. The most common theory says that the hill has such a strong magnetic force that it can pull cars in the vicinity. Now, how about seeing some flaming rocks? Yanartash spread over an area of over 3 square miles. The place is located on a rocky mountain in southwest Turkey near the town of Chiaralea. Yanartash got its name from its appearance. It literally means flaming stone. 
The rocks have been flaming for at least 2,500 years, and they'll probably keep burning for the coming decades. The mountain where the rocks are is an inactive volcano, so it's full of tiny fumaroles that release gases such as methane. The gas ignites when it comes into contact with oxygen and creates the flaming effect. Uh, and by the way, back in the day, sailors used the flames as a natural lighthouse, as it's really close to the sea. Today, it's more of a tourist attraction, though. Hikers love it, too. Now, walk on this frozen Lake Abraham in Canada. In winter, the frozen water gets filled with ice bubbles. It looks magical, but these white orbs aren't that safe. They consist of flammable methane gas. Ew. Beauty can be misleading. The next one is from Racetrack Death Valley, USA. There is a dry lake bed with moving rocks. Now These odd rocks look as if they've been pushed or dragged by someone or something. They leave both a trail and a mystery behind. The force behind all this is now understood. Surprise! It's the wind and some ice. Scientists say the wind pushes the rocks during brief windows when the soil is covered with ice. Now, I can't help but notice that many mysterious things on Earth involve stones or rocks or methane. Which one of these phenomena is your favorite? So, you've just finished your sightseeing tour of Edinburgh, Scotland, or Scotland. It lasts at just under an hour, and you're hungry for more. You ask your guide if there's anything else to see, and they start talking about a mysterious underground city. You ask how long it takes to get there, and you're shocked by the guide's answer. You're standing on it. It's right under your feet. South Bridge? But you were just there and didn't notice a giant arrow pointing down. Hmm. So this is where the mystery starts. The story begins in the mid-1700s. The Scottish capital wasn't as big as it is today. Only 60,000 people lived around Edinburgh Castle. All of them were packed inside medieval walls. And they say today's cities are overpopulated. Get a load of the living conditions back then. The buildings were tall, so there was little natural light. Some houses had 14 stories. Cows walked the narrow winding streets and left stuff. Things were so bad that the famous English writer Daniel Defoe noted, I believe that in no city in the world, so many people have so little room. Yep, that's the guy who wrote Robinson Crusoe. Well, something just had to be done. The solution was to build two long bridges to the north and to the south of the city. The names they gave the bridges were more descriptive than colorful. The bridge to the north was completed first. In 1785, construction on the second bridge got underway. It was going to connect the main pedestrian street in the north with the university buildings in the south of Edinburgh. But don't think of this construction as a modern bridge over a river. It was more of a viaduct, a type of bridge that connects two hills across a valley. The word viaduct comes from Latin, as Romans were pioneers in building these structures. Their capital was built on seven hills. And just to be copycats, Edinburgh also straddled seven major hills. Only two are visible today because the city has been built up. Now, Back in the 18th century, the construction of the South Bridge was a remarkable feat of engineering. It took the builders only three years to complete it. 19 stone arches spanned a chasm that was 31 feet at its deepest point, and the length over a thousand feet. Impressive, even for today's standards. But what does a two and a half centuries old viaduct have to do with an underground city? Well, it is the city. You see, they designed Southbridge to be hollow on the inside. As you walk along this street today, there is actually a huge human-made cave beneath your feet. The popular name for this set of chambers is the Edinburgh Vaults. But what was the purpose of this space? And is there something or someone there now? Well, let's take it one step at a time. The builder's original intention was for these vaults to serve as merchant shops. At first, it worked out fine. Merchants used a total of 120 vaults as shops and warehouses. There were workshops, cobblers, and taverns. But as time went by, a major design flaw came to light. The stone was leaking, and the vaults were damp all the time. 
There was even flooding. The builders forgot to waterproof the structure. The merchants feared the water would damage their precious goods. After just a couple of years, the first tenants started moving out. Once legal trade moved away from the vaults, the city's poor moved in. And not only them, but all sorts of shady characters. Historians don't know much about this period, since there are no written records. But even the squatters had to leave soon. If you couldn't do business in these vaults, how could you live in them? It was damp and cold, and there was no ventilation, sanitation, or natural light. It really stung. Every real estate agent's worst nightmare. Just 30 years after their completion, the Southbridge vaults were abandoned once and for all. But at a street level, business was as usual. The officials decided to fill the vaults with rubble for security purposes. Buried and forgotten, the memory of a once teeming merchant quarter of Edinburgh slowly faded from people's minds. Now, this is where the story gets a bit weird. During the 1980s, a Scottish rugby player accidentally found a tunnel leading into the vaults. The athlete didn't waste any time and started excavating the vaults with the help of his son. Several tons of rubble and, a decade later, the Southbridge vaults had been restored to their former glory, so to speak. They were again dark and damp, as they were back in the 1700s. There were many interesting finds in this underground city. The vaults were littered with oyster shells, which were the standard diet for a working-class resident of Edinburgh at the time. Other finds, such as shoes and empty bottles, suggested that people actually lived in these claustrophobic vaults. Think of this the next time you see someone trying to rent their garage as an apartment. So, your guide was right. There really is a hidden city under the streets of Edinburgh. Well, at least one street. You have now gone down from the main pedestrian street into Cowgate. You look up and there it is, the only visible arch of the once impressive bridge. You are now searching online to book a tour of the vaults. You just have to see this place with your own eyes. But the Scottish capital isn't the only city with a mysterious underground. The historic region of Cappadocia in central Turkey hides no less than 36 cities beneath the ground. The biggest and the most impressive one wasn't discovered until 1963. It was built during the Byzantine era to protect the local population from invaders. We have similar structures made out of concrete in our cities, but the level of the Turkish underground city is really impressive. There are several levels, like in a multi-story car garage. The caves and tunnels lie 197 feet underground. That's two-thirds of the Statue of Liberty's height. The city could house 20,000 people at any given time, complete with livestock and food. Mmm, the smell. Anyway, 20,000 is the average attendance at Major League Soccer matches today. You might want to add a field trip to one of these places the next time you go to Turkey. Most of these cities in Cappadocia can be found in rural areas. Makes sense, right? After all, they were dug out as hiding places. But in Europe, there is one city whose underground labyrinth resembles the vaults of Edinburgh. You've probably heard of Pilsen in the Czech Republic. But hold on a second, this isn't going to be a story of the most famous local product. Something brewed, perhaps? It's the story of a medieval city that survived underneath the streets of Pilsen. Water wells, cellars, and passageways stretch for more than 12 miles. Merchants and craftspeople use Pilsen's historical underground for storage. Water, food, ice, you name it. The waterworks are pretty impressive. Historians estimate that 360 wells are located under Pilsen's historical town center. In times of instability, the passageways served as safe havens for the locals. They definitely didn't go thirsty down there. Today, most tourists visit these mysterious underground cities. But in Canada, there's one where people live and work. The construction of Montreal's underground city began in 1962. The initial idea was to shelter traffic. That's a nice way to say that city officials were building a metro station. The idea caught on, and the project expanded. Now, it's a real-life urban maze hidden under the downtown area. Need a place to stay? There are hotels down there. Want to grab a bite? 
step into one of the underground restaurants. Multiple shops, a library, cinemas, the list is long. There are even residential complexes. But how can people live under the ground? Simple. Although the city itself lies beneath the earth, the access points are at ground level. You can enter the 20-mile-long tunnel network at more than 120 places. Oh, that's another place down under. Oops, sorry, Australia. Just a few months after the amazing success of Apollo 11, you know, the whole one step for a man, one giant leap for mankind story? NASA sent another mission to the moon. But things got pretty dicey during the launch of Apollo 12, which happened in November 1969. Still riding high on the triumph of the first moon landing, NASA decided to push the limits even further with Apollo 12's mission, planning to land on the Ocean of Storms, the biggest dark spot on the moon. For the first moon landing, they went for the Sea of Tranquility, because it's a relatively flat and even spot. This time around, the goal was to land the spacecraft with even more precision. Commander Pete Conrad and landing module pilot Al Bean would get to spend more time on the lunar surface with two excursions planned. They would even get to send back the first color TV images from the moon. On November 14th, the team climbed aboard the massive Saturn V rocket in Florida while the flight director took his place at the Mission Control Center in Houston. It was his first time leading a mission, and little did he know about the dramatic events that would soon unfold. Near the launching site, some storms had occurred, so the ground was a bit wet and the sky was cloudy. At 11.22, the huge white rocket started to lift off the pad and zoom up into the sky. Conrad and his team were shouting in excitement. But then, only 36 seconds into the flight, something went wrong. There was a flash, and all the power to the spacecraft was gone. It was really scary, and all the alarms started going off. The team inside Apollo 12 was perplexed. They had no idea what had happened. But after some investigation, they found out that the rocket had been hit not once, but twice by lightning strikes. The good news was that the rocket's design allowed it to continue its mission despite the unexpected setback. Even though it seemed like they were in deep trouble, the Saturn V guidance computer was totally fine and kept the rocket on track. They soon got into orbit and said, hey, let's go to the moon. Four days later, Conrad and Bean made a great landing just feet away from their target, the Surveyor 3 probe. Conrad was so excited to explore the lunar surface that he couldn't wait to get outside. The whole NASA team behind this mission was worried that people might have lost interest in the program after Apollo 11. But they had a plan. The first color TV broadcast from the surface. Two companies were tasked with broadcasting the lunar mission live. In those days, it was important because having two networks joining the effort meant they could reach millions of people. However, even though NASA focused on TV as a way to connect with the public, the astronauts didn't really get trained on how to use the camera. When Conrad made his way down the ladder to the moon's surface, he had to open up a storage bay to get the video camera out. The footage was a bit blurry and showed only his legs at first. But it was still amazing to see. After a little while, Bean popped up next to his teammate on the surface, and they both took a moment to soak up the crazy new world they found themselves in. Bean wanted to make sure everybody back on Earth could watch what was happening, so he grabbed the camera, wanting to set it up on a stand. But oops! He accidentally aimed it at the sun, and most of the screen went dark, except for a really bright white spot at the top. Whoopsies, I guess. Even though the astronauts and mission control team tried really hard, they couldn't fix the camera. It looked like the image sensors were busted for good. Thankfully, the TV networks had a plan B. They switched over to a studio where two actors dressed up like astronauts did a cool simulation of the moonwalk. Very fine grain, you get they still played the real voices of the astronauts, though, so the audience got to hear everything they were saying. 
Apollo 12's story didn't end once the astronauts got back to Earth safely. In September 2002, a strange space object was noticed by astronauts. It was orbiting our planet in an unusual way. Little did they know that the mysterious object was connected to the Apollo 12 mission. Scientists initially thought the object was an asteroid. They were surprised by this discovery since they thought the Moon was the only natural object orbiting Earth. This thing wasn't an asteroid at all, though. It was actually human-made. Turns out, it was the rocket that launched the Apollo 12 astronauts to the Moon. It left Earth in 1969 and came back 30 years later. What do you think happened to it during all that time? Named the Saturn V rocket, it had three stages, each with a specific job to get the astronauts to the moon. The first stage burned for two and a half minutes, lifting them to 42 miles above the Earth's surface. The second stage then took over for six minutes, taking them even higher and faster. Finally, the third stage gave a quick burn to get the spacecraft into orbit. Once there, it did another burn to send the rocket and the crew toward the moon. After that, the third stage was supposed to be discarded safely. Or so everyone hoped. During the Apollo 12 mission, though, things didn't go quite to plan with the discarded part. In order to ditch Apollo 12's third stage, NASA had to program it to have a special path to meet up with the moon. But their first calculations would have led the third stage of the rocket to the wrong side of the moon. So they had to adjust the target and the speed. Luckily, the third stage had these cool little thrusters that helped it turn around. Even though specialists had to adjust their plan, it didn't waste much energy since it was done in advance. By the time they let that third portion of the rocket go, the team had been going super fast. To make sure the part went to the right spot, they just had to slow it down a bit. Easy peasy, you might think. Yet again, things didn't go exactly as planned. In reality, NASA had a little mishap with their tracking system when they sent this rocket. It turns out the system was a bit off, which caused them to slow down the rocket too much and overcorrect it by just 25 miles per hour. This small mistake ended up affecting the rocket's initial trajectory. At one point, it even reached Lagrange Point 1, which is a special point in space where the gravitational forces of Earth and the Sun balance out. The plan for this third part of the rocket was to send it on a trajectory beyond our planet, making it orbit the Sun. It would have been our safest bet, ensuring it wouldn't affect future missions to the Moon by accidentally bumping into other spacecraft. But because of the miscalculations, this unlucky piece still ended up traveling around the Sun, but in a wacky pattern on the inside of Earth's own orbit around the star. It took 30 years for this unusual object to be dragged back to our planet's orbit by coming across it at the Lagrange Point 1 again, finally. Once it reached this point, it began to spin around Earth in a very unusual pattern. To eventually identify the rocket, scientists performed spectroscopy. This method allowed them to identify what sorts of materials were inside the object. In short, they were able to figure out the composition of the rocket by studying the way it reflected light. It didn't take long before they figured out that what they were looking at was a special kind of white paint that was used for coating NASA rockets. Earthquake lights are some of the most mysterious natural phenomena. They can show up before, during, or after an earthquake. They're usually white or blue and last for a short time, but sometimes they can last up to 10 minutes. It's hard to study them because they can happen at different distances from an earthquake center. We know that they only happen during powerful earthquakes that have a Richter scale rating of 5 or higher. Scientists believe they may be caused by the release of ionized oxygen that occurs when certain rocks break apart. This next weird phenomenon is not spontaneous, but it doesn't make it any less impressive. You'll need to head over to La Macarena, Colombia to see it. It's called the Liquid Rainbow, or the River of Five Colors. Here you can see the river change colors from red, 
yellow, green, and purple, depending on the light and water conditions. This amazing sight is caused by a very talented aquatic plant. It attaches itself to the rocks in the river and gives the water a reddish color. The water is also very clear, with very few particles floating in it, making the red pigments show even clearer. Should you ever reach this amazing destination, you'll also meet diverse fauna hanging around the lake. Red macaws can be seen at this location as well as howler monkeys. Every fall and spring, a magnificent natural phenomenon takes place in the Wadden Sea region in Northern Europe. Approximately 1.5 million starlings flock at the same spot to rest in the tall grass for the night. However, before the night settles in, the starlings may be surrounded by hungry birds of prey. This creates a mesmerizing dance as the starlings form intricate patterns to escape from the birds of prey. This spectacle is referred to as the black sun and involves thousands of millions of birds flying in formation. The reason for their synchronized flight is that it makes it more challenging for predators to single out and capture some of the starlings. Volcanic sounds, also called volcanic acoustics, can happen before an eruption. They come from magma getting pressurized in cracks and pipes, bubbling explosions, and hot water systems near the surface of the volcano. As the magma rises, gas builds up and cracks the surface open. The gas-rich magma creates a sound like a pipe organ, which is known as a volcanic tremor. The sound changes over time, resembling a natural concert. A volcanic tremor is a sign that an eruption is coming. So it's best to seek shelter if you hear anything unusual near a volcanic site. One of the most surreal phenomena to experience on Earth is near sand dunes. Should you ever be at the top of a sand dune, you may be lucky enough to hear one of the strangest things, singing sand. The truth is scientists have yet to fully understand why this phenomenon occurs. One theory claims that the sand might produce this sound while sliding down the dunes because of the friction between its grains. But how can you recognize whether what you hear is singing sand? Well, it's similar to an airplane flying in the distance. One of the few places on Earth where sand makes such a loud noise that it can actually be heard by tourists is in the Namib Desert in Africa, or in the barking sands of Hawaii. To see a rare golden waterfall, you'll have to drive to Yosemite National Park, more precisely, to the Horsetail Falls. You will need to plan your trip ahead of time to make sure you get there either in the winter or early spring. It's the only period of the year when this beautiful sight can be spotted. Let's be clear, it's not real gold falling down the mountain. Actually, it's an optical illusion. When at dusk, the sunlight hits the waterfall in such a unique way that it makes it look like a river of lava or gold. In a Californian national park called Death Valley, there are some rocks that seem to move on their own and leave trails behind. Scientists thought the roadrunner bird could be responsible for these movements, but this creature is too small to drag rocks around. They also thought it could be the wind, but the rocks are also too heavy to be blown away. Scientists have been studying the rocks for years. But until 2014, they hadn't actually seen the rocks move. They'd just seen them in different positions at different times. With the help of time-lapse photography, they discovered that the movement was caused by a combination of rainfall, rapid temperature changes, and a bit of wind. When it rains, the water sometimes freezes and the rocks get stuck in the ice. As the temperature rises, the ice starts to melt and moves slowly, dragging the rocks with it. The traces left behind solidify under the heat of the sun. The ice sheets that move the rocks is very thin and evaporates quickly which is why it was difficult for scientists to understand this phenomenon. Have you ever heard of a dirty thunderstorm? Buckle up, because I'm about to take you on a wild ride through the world of volcanic lightning. No, it's not a new dancing technique, although that would be pretty impressive. It's just a funky way of saying lightning and thunder during a volcanic eruption. When a regular thunderstorm happens, positive and negative particles collide and create a big spark of lightning. 
And the rumble you hear? That's just thunder. But when a volcano starts to holler, some ash particles get electrified and start colliding with each other. This causes electrical discharges, making it look like there's lightning coming straight from the volcano. And with all the ash, smoke, and gas flying around, it looks like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. That's why it's sometimes called a dirty thunderstorm too. Whoa! Did you just see that giant ray of light shooting up into the sky? They're called light pillars. And don't worry, they're not a magic trick. Just a bunch of ice crystals playing tricks on us. You see, when it's cold outside, these ice crystals floating near the ground reflect light from unshielded lights and create these columns of light that look like they're coming from outer space. But really, it's just a bunch of little crystals showing off their reflective skills. And if you think those natural light pillars are cool, wait till you see the artificial ones. They can be even taller because the light from streetlights is not the same. Ice crystals can reflect the light even if they're a little tilted. Just imagine, all that light is coming from streetlights just a few feet away. So next time you see a light pillar, don't run for cover, just enjoy the show. If you come across these quirky, bubble-like shapes in the sky, consider yourself lucky. These little gems are called mammatus clouds, and they're not your everyday run-of-the-mill clouds. Most clouds are formed when air rises, making them look like big cotton balls. But mammatus clouds are formed when air sinks, making them look like they're upside down. The air above and below such clouds creates a little turbulence, and before you know it, cloud particles form perfectly round orbs. Just don't stand there gawking at them for too long. They often signal that a thunderstorm is on its way. What do we have here? It looks like the sun is wearing a colorful party hat made of rainbows on top of the Ore Mountains in Germany. This phenomenon is called a sun halo, by the way. These snow-covered trees look like they're joining in on the fun too. It's all thanks to those ice crystals in high clouds. They love to bend and reflect light, making it look like the sun is having a halo lava lamp dance party. And yes, it might mean that bad weather is just around the corner, but don't let it spoil your fun. You can still hang around and take some great pictures. This region between Florida and the Bahamas is a famous place for studying various marine life. However, there's a mysterious phenomenon that happens here each year, the reasons for which scientists have yet to figure out. At times, people can see these white clouds appearing on the surface of the water. In technical terms, this occurrence is called a whiting event. With the information they have so far, scientists believe that the white patches may contain particles that are rich in carbon. The Bahama Islands do sit on a big platform of carbon, which stays hidden under the water. Another suggested theory for these unusual clouds is that maybe they're caused by blooms of tiny plants in the water. Scientists have even tried to use pictures taken from above by NASA to at least try to understand the movement of these water vapors. They've figured out that the size of the white patches seems to change with the seasons, with the biggest patches happening from March to May and October to December. The average size of a white patch is about 0.9 square miles. On a clear day, satellite pictures show about 24 patches. Other studies show that these events happen more often in places with considerable amounts of sediments at the bottom of the ocean. It's also possible that some ocean conditions make dirt and minerals float in the water. However, from 2011 to 2015, the patches in the ocean suddenly became almost four times larger. But by 2019, they had shrunk back down. It made scientists believe that there might be a 10-year cycle of sorts happening here. But they're not sure what causes it. They've also noticed a connection between the ocean's pH, salinity, winds, and currents. But for now, the data doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not the only secret Earth's oceans keep from us. Have you ever wondered about the deepest part of the ocean? It's known as the Mariana Trench, and it's believed to be around 6.8 miles deep, making it five times deeper than the Grand Canyon. The trench was first studied in 1875 with the help of a weighted rope. 
and in 2012, a Canadian film director reached its bottom using the Deep Sea Challenger submersible vessel. The Mariana Trench is home to some of the most bizarre creatures on the planet, like the Dumbo octopus, sea cucumber, and goblin shark. The trench takes its name from the nearby Mariana Islands, named in honor of Spanish Queen Mariana of Austria. It may be the deepest part of the ocean these days, but there's a lot we still don't know about the depths of our planet's waters. One such intriguing phenomenon is called phantom bottoms. In the 1940s, when sonar became standard equipment, ships and submarines started to detect unexpected signals from areas where no movement should technically exist. It turned out that these signals were coming from a layer consisting of jellyfish, shrimp, and other deep sea creatures. They rise to the surface at night to feed. Interestingly, these creatures move in a calculated manner, grouping together by species. It's still a mystery to scientists how they managed to do that and why. It was once believed that animals only group this way to avoid predators, but the reasons behind the formation of these fake seabeds remain unknown. Recently, the scientific community has acknowledged the existence of a fifth ocean called the Southern Ocean. This ocean is bordered by three of the four original oceans and encircles Antarctica and the lower hemisphere with its borders touching Australia, Southern Africa, and South America. It's a unique ocean, attracting attention and sparking curiosity with its secrets and the creatures it might hold. Rumors of a monstrous creature in these waters have been circulating for some time, and recent research has provided video evidence of strange blob-like fish. The creatures were identified as the sea cucumber with the nickname the headless chicken monster. Although this species has been known since the late 1800s, there's very little information about it, including its count, behavior, and reproductive habits. There are also areas in the world where the ocean literally sparkles. It's not because of the water per se, but because of numerous creatures that have the ability to emit light, known as bioluminescence. This is pretty common among aquatic creatures, with three quarters of all underwater life being capable of this. Bioluminescence can be found anywhere, from the surface to deep within the sea, even as deep as 2.5 miles. These creatures use light for various purposes. For example, for communicating with their own species, attracting prey, or scaring predators away. The science behind bioluminescence involves the use of three chemicals, luciferin, luciferase, and oxygen. This process was first discovered by a French biologist named Raphael Dubois in 1887. If you want to know the difference between real bioluminescence and artificially created light, look for neon blue, green, or red sparkles spread over a large area in the ocean. This can create a captivating and magical effect, much like glitter or stars in the sky. And it's often because of squid, small crustaceans, and algae found in shallow waters. Have you ever heard a strange noise in the middle of the night? Now imagine that, but in the middle of the ocean! There are a few bizarre sounds that have been heard and recorded, like the bloop and Julia. Most experts think they come from big things, like icebergs scraping the ocean floor. But what if that's not the answer? In 1997, Scientists were listening to underwater volcano noises in the Pacific using underwater microphones called hydrophones. One day, they heard a very loud and strange sound that was different from anything they had heard before. They called the sound the bloop. They couldn't figure out what was making this sound and thought it could be coming from a secret underwater mission, ship engines, whales, or an unknown sea creature. Years went by and researchers continued to try and find the source of the bloop by putting hydrophones closer to Antarctica. In 2005, they finally discovered that the bloop was caused by icebergs breaking off glaciers and falling into the ocean. This phenomenon is called an ice quake. With Earth's overall temperature rising each year, ice quakes are happening more often, causing glaciers to crack and melt into the ocean. 
Then, on March 1, 1999, a loud noise was again heard underwater in the Pacific. The U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration thought it was probably an iceberg breaking, too. But the sound was different. This led some people to think the noise came from a sea monster named Julia. Some thought it was a new unknown species, while others believed it was a known creature, like a whale or a giant squid. Some even thought it could be a prehistoric animal. To this day, there's no proof that any of these theories are true. Then there's a story of an island that was swallowed whole by the ocean. It was called Bermeja, and it was a tiny and uninhabited island located at the northwest of the Yucatan Peninsula. Just a century ago, it was known to be located in the Gulf of Mexico, but now it's vanished, leaving everyone puzzled. In the past, Bermeja was frequently depicted on maps created by Spanish explorers during the 16th and 17th centuries. Although its location and name varied slightly, no one ever doubted it existed. However, starting from the 18th century, the island's presence on maps started to fade until it finally disappeared completely. So, what could have happened to it? Three official investigations were conducted in 2009 with the help of the most advanced technology. But Bermeja remained a mystery. Could it be possible that the island never existed and was simply a fabrication created by early explorers to deceive their rivals? Some people believe that countries made maps with inaccuracies to prevent their enemies from using them. Bermeja could have been one of such fake islands. Other scientists disagree. They claim that there are documents with precise descriptions of Bermeja's existence. They firmly believe the island did exist, but in a different location. The ancient city of Taposiris Magna is hidden on the northern coast of Egypt. These days it has very little of its former glory, but what lies beneath it may hold the secret to uncovering a famous mystery, that of Cleopatra, the most memorable Egyptian queen in history. The recently discovered tunnel is also known as a geometric miracle for its time. Excavations have uncovered a 43-foot-long structure below the ground, which is partially submerged in water. Its shape and construction technique are similar to that of the Eupolinos Tunnel, another amazing ancient discovery. This one is located in Greece and was built by excavating simultaneously from two points, aiming to have them meet in the middle. The use of math and geometry to make this construction was astonishingly precise for those days, more so since it was built near a mountain. Archaeologists that have been working on the Taposiris Magna site since 2004 believe this tunnel may lead to the lost tomb of Cleopatra. The clues they found so far seem to back up this theory. For starters, the city and its temple were built by one of Cleopatra's ancestors, Ptolemy II. All the architecture seems to indicate it was dedicated to the ancient spirit Osiris and his queen Isis. Throughout her reign, Cleopatra did try to associate herself with Isis, so it may be no surprise she chose this location as her final resting place. Scientists have yet to pinpoint Cleopatra's tomb, but research continues with the help of modern technology. To study this location better, Archaeologists have even used a special device called ground-penetrating radar. This tool allows us to analyze what lies beneath the ground without being intrusive. Since this tunnel is so old, research needs to be done very delicately. Seeing pictures of what's underground before you start digging is incredibly useful and has been done here since 2011. Finally discovering Cleopatra's tomb may help us piece together her story especially what might have happened during the last portion of her life, which is still surrounded by mystery. We still don't know the exact cause of her passing. Some believe she may have let herself be bitten by a poisonous Egyptian cobra. Others have suggested that she was well accustomed to toxic substances, even hiding some in her hairbrush in case she ever needed it. But that's not to say she chose to use it on herself. We do have a lot of other interesting information on Cleopatra that's equally as impressive, like the fact that she had a stylist. Most of the images you've seen depicting this famous queen show her wearing black eyeliner. 
This look was put together by Ayras, a woman known to have been her personal beautician. She traced the long line from her eyes to her temples, a makeup technique still used today to enhance the eyes. Ayras was an important figure throughout Cleopatra's life, known also as her confidant and close friend. There are even theories that suggest Ayras was there by her side when she passed away. Despite her well-thought-out looks, Cleopatra wasn't as pretty as she's described. Or at least, that's what recent research has pointed out. Sure, if we look at movies and modern imagery, she's depicted as this incredibly beautiful woman with symmetrical and delicate features. However, if we look at coins showcasing her image from back in the day, her looks are rather average. Her image on the coins might have been adjusted too to make the queen look stronger in the eyes of her people. So there is no trusted source available to confirm her image, but her description in most pieces of ancient literature speaks of her other qualities, like her voice and personality, not of her beauty. Cleopatra might have been the most famous Egyptian queen to this day, but she wasn't the first choice. She did have an older sister, Berenice, that was initially supposed to take the throne. Berenice passed away before she could do that, so Cleopatra took on the role and began investing in her education. She traveled throughout the country quite frequently, so she could become accustomed to her people and their needs. She was only 18 when the responsibilities were passed down to her and immediately gained popularity because of her intelligence and education. Her taste in literature was quite good too. She was known to be a fan of Homer, the famed Greek philosopher and poet. Cleopatra loved to write as much as she loved to read. There are even claims that she wrote a book on medicine and cosmetics, but we have no evidence to this day that such work ever existed. Part of being a great leader back then meant you had to speak multiple languages. Cleopatra clearly understood that, and that's why she's rumored to have known many languages to varying degrees. Some archaeologists suggested she spoke Greek, Egyptian, and Ethiopian, as well as many Arabic dialects. She might have even spoken Latin, but there's little evidence to support this claim. She might not have had angelic looks, but Cleopatra was really careful with the way she looked, even with her diet. She was known to have enjoyed simple meals, including a variety of fish. Since she lived close to the Mediterranean Sea, it's really no surprise. As a treat, she liked to eat stuffed pigeons, which she also served to her guests. Other dishes on the menu included vegetables and fava bean soup. Fruits and nuts weren't missing from her diet either, and she was also a big fan of honey. Recently, a team of experts has even tried to recreate her famous perfume. Think of it like the ancient equivalent of Chanel No. 5. Cleopatra was known to be a fan of luxurious scents, which she believed could even influence how people treated her when they met. The basis of this scent is myrrh, a resin gathered from a local tree. Other ingredients added to the mixture were also found back in the day, like cardamom, olive oil, and cinnamon. The results may not be quite as delicate as the perfumes we know and use today. Its consistency was way thicker, and the scent lasted way longer. When she was at the height of her power, Cleopatra might have been the richest person in the world. Back in the day, she ruled over a territory that stretched across the Mediterranean, from modern-day Libya in the west through Egypt to Syria in the east. This is the largest territory ever ruled over by a woman. In today's currency, her worth might have been somewhere around $95 billion. The calendars we use today may have been introduced by Cleopatra herself. She presented the idea of leap years and leap days to Caesar, the Roman emperor she was known to have been close with. Taking her advice, Caesar made these adjustments part of the official Roman calendar. The ancient Egyptians already knew the year was longer than precisely 365 days. They discovered this by studying the brightest star in the sky, called Sirius, and concluded that a year is actually 365 and one quarter days long.
It was Elizabeth Taylor that famously introduced Cleopatra to pop culture when she played her in the 1963 film bearing the same name. Up until that point, it was the most expensive film ever made. It was originally supposed to cost somewhere around $2 million, but ended up costing a mind-boggling $44 million. That's mostly because of script and production issues. To make this iconic movie, producers created 79 sets from scratch, as well as over 26,000 costumes for the cast. Elizabeth Taylor's Cleopatra costumes alone cost somewhere around $200,000. Thankfully for the producers, the movie made headlines and was well received by critics, making it a box office success. A lot of people associate Cleopatra with another famous Egyptian ruler, King Tutankhamun, nicknamed King Tut. Surprisingly, apart from both of them being Egyptian pharaohs, they have nothing else in common. For starters, King Tut lived around 1300 years before Cleopatra did, and there is also no connection regarding their ancestry. Cleopatra had Macedonian Greek roots, while King Tut was a native Egyptian. Now, if you could get into a time machine and travel back to 1969, you'd see something spectacular. What you're looking at isn't some random desert. It's one of the most powerful waterfalls, completely dry. In the summer and fall of 1969, the American side of Niagara Falls stayed without water. It lasted six months. Researchers wanted to study the rock face of the falls. They were afraid it was going to become too unstable because of erosion. Erosion is the process when natural forces, such as water and wind, wear away earthen materials. For example, if you see glacial ice become muddy, it means erosion is happening. Three waterfalls that cross the international border between Canada and the United States together make something we know as the magnificent Niagara Falls. The three waterfalls are the Horseshoe Falls, the American Falls, and the Bridal Veil Falls, in order from largest to smallest. The American Falls are fully on the American side, while the Horseshoe Falls are primarily on the Canadian side, divided by Goat Island. The Bridal Veil Falls, the smallest of them all, are on the American side, but separated from the others by Luna Island. Don't America and Canada have a cool natural border? Many didn't believe we could actually go against wild nature and stop such insane amounts of water from flowing. But we did it! It took a 600-foot dam across the enormous Niagara River to really shut down these astonishing falls. This means they had to divert 60,000 gallons of water every second so that the remaining flow traveled over the biggest horseshoe falls. Yup, the ones that are completely on the Canadian side of the border. Over 27,000 tons of rock were used to construct that dam. And more than 1,000 trucks carried that rock back in the hot summer of 69. On June 12, the American Falls stopped after their continuous flow for more than 12,000 years. So the Horseshoe Falls then took the extra flow and absorbed it so that research could be done. But the locals were still worried. They knew it wasn't possible to control such amounts of water. They were afraid the water might take a different route and cause a catastrophic flood. They were worried that tourists wouldn't come anymore if teams didn't manage to make the waterfall flow again the way it used to. But tourists kept coming even that summer, and they got a unique chance to see something no one had ever seen before or after. During that period, there was even a temporary walkway built only 20 feet away from the edge of the now dry falls. It helped workers to clean the bottom of what used to be a river. So tourists could go there and explore the wild landscape of the falls that was usually under the water, hostile, and not accessible to visitors at all. As they were exploring the dried bottom of the falls, researchers stumbled upon millions of different coins people had thrown in the water over decades, maybe to make a wish or for some other purpose. Wow, a Niagara Falls piggy bank! Well, they removed most of those coins. I wonder who got them. But in the past couple of decades, more and more tourists have been coming here. Imagine all the things they could find now. More coins, of course, but also lost cameras, errant drones, cell phones, and other things careless visitors could accidentally drop in the waterfalls. The idea of removing all the water and turning Niagara Falls into a desert proved to be possible. But it may need to be done again. In 2020, the media reported that two pedestrian bridges in Niagara Falls needed to be either replaced or repaired. 
No wonder, since they're almost 120 years old. These bridges are located above the rapids. Experts discuss whether they should divert the water once again or not. People talk about Niagara Falls a lot, and some believe they're among the tallest waterfalls in the world. But the truth is, they're not. They're famous, precious, and breathtaking. But when it comes to height, there are nearly 500 other waterfalls across the globe that are taller than Niagara. Let's take Angel Falls in Venezuela, for example. They're more than 3,000 feet tall. But what makes Niagara Falls so special, among other waterfalls, is the amount of water that flows over them. Very high waterfalls don't usually have great amounts of water. The combination of all those huge amounts of water and the height is what makes Niagara Falls so breathtaking. Also, they might be some of the fastest-moving waterfalls on our planet. The Niagara River appeared after the last ice age, together with the whole Great Lakes Basin. The Niagara River is part of it. 18,000 years ago, I wasn't around then, this awesome waterfall didn't exist. Ice sheets covered the area of southern Ontario. They were 1 to 2 miles thick. As the ice sheets were moving southward, they created the basin of the Great Lakes. Then they melted, releasing enormous amounts of water into the basins. Generally, the water we drink is fossil water. Only 1% of it renews through the year, with the remaining 99% coming from ice sheets. The Niagara Peninsula hasn't been beneath the ice for nearly 12,500 years. As the ice melted, the resulting water started to flow down through what later turned into Niagara River, Lake Erie, and Lake Ontario. It took a lot of time, but the water eventually eroded cliffs and formed these spectacular falls. Now, you might have noticed that the Niagara River is amazingly green. This specific color tells us how powerful the water is when it comes to erosion. Every minute, Niagara Falls spews over 60 tons of dissolved minerals. All that, together with dissolved salt and finely ground rock, makes the color so magnificent. People who live in the United States and Canada, or more precisely, over a million people who have access to the area, use the waters of Niagara River for different purposes. For example, fishing, getting drinking water, doing recreational activities, including swimming, boating, and bird watching, producing hydroelectric power, and so much more. Now, the first hydroelectric generating station in the world was built at the end of the 19th century, and it was right next to the falls. Pretty soon, it started paying off because people were getting electricity from it. But this electricity could travel only 300 feet, so something needed to be improved there. Nikola Tesla was the one who took up the challenge and made the necessary changes. He discovered that electricity could travel long distances if an alternating current was used. Today, several Niagara Falls power plants provide over 2 million kilowatts of power. Okay, I'll tell you another interesting thing. 1969 wasn't the only time when Niagara Falls stopped. Back in 1848, the water didn't flow over the falls for up to 40 hours. Now, the falls were already very popular among tourists and a useful source of energy for local people. So, no wonder they freaked out. Nature was to blame this time. Ice blocked the source of the Niagara River. An American farmer was the first one to notice it. It was March 29th, and he went for a walk right before midnight. Soon, he realized he couldn't hear the powerful roar of the falls. He quickly went to the edge of the river and stood there in shock. There was hardly any water. Factories and mills had to shut down because they depended on that water. Turtles were just wandering around. Fish didn't survive. Some people took a walk on the river bottom, taking little things they could find there as souvenirs. But two days later, on March 31st, people heard a distant rumbling coming from upriver. It was getting nearer and louder until a wall of water appeared in front of their eyes. And one of the world's greatest attractions that millions of tourists visit every year was back in business again. Magnificent and, in the end, invincible. As it should be. It's nighttime, and you're about to walk inside Pharaoh Tutankhamun's final resting place. You know, King Tut. You don't have a torch, but at least you came with a flashlight. You walk down several flights of stairs and observe how the walls are carved in hieroglyphics and what looks like a spell. Those who take anything from this place will be doomed for life, the spell says. Even if you don't really believe it, this scares you a little bit. You find a huge stone door. Is it a trap? You manage to open it, but oh no, it's only an empty chamber. 
You check your map. It seems like you're heading in the right direction. After what feels like hours, you realize you must be trapped inside a labyrinth. You try to retrace your steps, but you can't find the door where you came in from anymore. That's it, you think to yourself. You've fallen for the pharaoh's trap. What's worse? You didn't bring a lunch. Okay, so we've all seen Hollywood movies where the main character is exploring ancient ruins and faces some seriously dangerous traps, right? We've been told Egyptian royalty protected their final resting places with venomous scorpions and snakes, sliding doors that will trap you for life, and giant rolling boulders that will crush anyone on their paths. The thing is, were these traps truly real? Well, I regret to be the one to break it to you, but this is all fiction. These elaborate traps were too technologically advanced for ancient civilizations to pull off. That is not to say, however, that there weren't any traps at all. Ancient civilizations, like the Egyptians and the Mayans, are known for their practice of building entire monuments dedicated to the ones who had passed away. These structures would often reflect the position of person occupied in society. So, for the really important people, the VIPs of their times, massive monuments were built to host their bodies long after they were gone. Some of these civilizations believed that a person's life would continue on the other side of the veil. For that reason, a person would be buried together with the belongings of their current life. If they had a lot of money and power and stuff, that meant their resting places would be filled with riches and gold. Now imagine if you lived in ancient Egypt, and you knew exactly where all the pharaoh's tombs were located and had heard rumors of the amount of wealth kept in these places. Maybe you would be tempted to go check it out, right? We're talking about large rooms filled from floor to ceiling with golden artifacts, jewels, and even money. I mean, it does sound tempting. And since there weren't any security guards protecting the entrance of these places, Egyptians needed to get creative as to how they would protect these riches. These old civilizations found some traps to be useful. A recurring one was building empty rooms inside the monument to confuse a burglar. Now, let's take a look at Amenhotep III's final resting place as an example. It was built in the city of Luxor, in a spot also known as the Western Valley of the Kings. Two French engineers originally discovered the monument between 1905 and 1914 CE. The structure is huge and has more than 10 chambers, connected by long corridors and steep stairways. The king's chamber is the most hidden one, and for an outsider to try and find it, they will probably enter a lot of empty rooms beforehand. Other pharaohs tried to protect their riches by commissioning monuments with false doors concealing pits that were up to 20 feet deep. This way, an unwarned and unwanted visitor would be surprised by the deep hole on their way to the king's resting chamber. Alongside false doors, pharaohs made sure to build labyrinth-style corridors and false walls. This way, robbers could take hours or days before they found the king's real chamber. As to pits with poisonous snakes on them, if there were any reptiles inside these monuments, they probably got inside on their own and would most likely not stay there for long. There is no way snakes would survive years and years without food inside these pits. So yes, another Hollywood-induced belief right there. If these traps seem boring to you, archaeologists did find an interesting deterrent in the final resting place of the Red Queen of Polanque in Mexico. Polanque was one of the most powerful Mayan cities in pre-Columbian Mexico. And the Red Queen was believed to be the grandmother of the last Mayan king, undoubtedly a person of immense importance to the empire. In her honor, a huge monument was built to keep her body after her passing. The discovery of the tomb itself was already thrilling. Archaeologists found an ancient monument when digging at the site back in 1994. The first thing they found was a room with a hidden door. Once they opened the door, they discovered a long corridor. Finally, at the end of this corridor was the Queen's Chamber. The team of archaeologists was beyond excited to unearth this chamber with the mummy of the Queen herself still inside it. They found her to be accompanied by her pearls, jade shells, and expensive rocks. But as the team explored the remains, 
they saw something rather strange. The room was filled with a red-colored powder. Researchers knew that the color red was important to the Mayan people, and that much of their clothing and buildings were decorated with this color. But they didn't understand why the queen was buried with this unknown red substance. After they took a sample back with them for further analysis, they discovered that the red powder was cinnabar, a very dangerous mineral. This powder, when inhaled, can cause, shall we say, severe health damage to a person. The team concluded that this could only be a trap for anyone trying to steal her riches. Okay, so dangerous powders might have worked as the most intense traps we've seen until now. But perhaps the cheapest way to keep out unwanted visitors was to advertise spells written out all over the monument. We'd probably laugh at these today, but back in the day, they were more or less effective. Spells usually said that the person who took anything from that place would meet a tragic fate. Some spells said that robbers would lose their houses in big fires or terrible floods. Other spells said burglars would have incurable and undiagnosed health issues, but they weren't really enough to stop people from taking any gold. There are some stories surrounding how these spells might have been real. One of them is from the famous British Egyptologist Howard Carter, the one responsible for unearthing Pharaoh Tutankhamun's resting place in the 1920s. After months of unsuccessful digging, Carter discovered the tomb's existence by chance. He found the entrance to a stairway right beneath the soil where he had been searching all those months. With the help of a team, he cleared the piles of sand blocking the stairs and discovered a doorway. The door had several royal symbols carved into it, and Carter knew this could only mean a very important person had been buried there. And he was right. With a chisel, he made a hole in the top left-hand corner of the doorway and lit his vision with the help of a candle. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. The reflection of several golden and jeweled items crowding the chamber before him. Lost for 3,000 years, Carter had just discovered the final resting place of King Tut. But the story didn't finish here. This discovery was accompanied by a series of unfortunate events that led people to believe it had something to do with the pharaoh's spell. Carter himself mysteriously passed away just a few years later, and some of his assistants lost their houses in floods, just like one of the spells threatened. Some say it's just coincidental, as there's no real proof of these things being connected. Well, what do you think? Was this an effective trap after all? Imagine you could spend an entire week scanning ancient ruins and taking photographs of the world's most surreal archaeological sites. Would you be up for it? So, let's do some digging. The first stop on your busy itinerary is Southeast Asia. It's home to some pretty cool ruins. You start in Bagan, located in the hinterlands of Myanmar. There are many ways to visit the site, and you're glad you've booked two different experiences. The first one is a hot air balloon trip at sunrise. Right before dawn, you board the balloon, and as soon as the sun starts to appear on the horizon, you begin your flight over the marvelous area. As the sun rises, it glistens on more than 2,000 conic-shaped golden structures. The hot air balloon ride is quick, but it gives you unparalleled views of all the 40 miles over which the site sprawls. Back on land, you rent a bicycle and roam the village of ruins. Some of them are open and allow you to peep inside. These magnificent ruins were built between the 11th and 13th century CE and were mainly places of worship. There were originally over 10,000 buildings but they were gradually deteriorating over time due to earthquakes. Thankfully, the site became a UNESCO World Heritage Site back in 2015 and has since been preserved. Up next, you catch a flight to Cambodia. You take some time to visit Angkor. The world-famous archaeological site nestled deep within the jungle. Good thing you've brought bug spray with you. The city of Angkor was once the capital of the Khmer Empire from the 9th to 15th century. FYI, 
The word Angkor means capital city in the Khmer language. The city was founded by King Yasovarman I, and it became one of the largest cities in the pre-industrial world. Researchers say nearly one million people live there. Until today, Angkor is admired for its stunning architecture. The Khmer style is recognized in the use of huge blocks of sandstone. The towers are believed to have been once decorated with gold. But today, the site is a maze of vine-covered temples. The city was abandoned in 1431 and wasn't rediscovered until the 1840s. Oh, and just so you know, this is also a UNESCO heritage site. It became one in 1992. In case you want to brag to your friends about your culturally rich adventures in the future. Now, your trip continues in Egypt. You're here to visit the Karnak Temple in the city of Luxor. You opt for the most unusual way to get to Luxor. That is, a boat ride down the Nile River. Leaving Cairo, you head south until you reach the famous ancient city. Luxor was once the capital of Egypt and a true hub of power and wealth. That is why the Karnak complex is such a great archaeological site. You choose to visit it at night, and still at the entrance, you are struck by the site's beauty. In the evening, artificial lights cast a golden glow on the temple statues and stone columns. The temple is huge and was built mainly around the 18th and 19th centuries BCE. Each Egyptian pharaoh from that period left their own architectural mark on the site. The highlight of this tour is taking a walk through the Avenue of Sphinxes and discovering the Great Hypostyle Hall. This hall is filled with towering pylons and solid sandstone columns, a true wonder. From Egypt, you head down to Jordan. Now, if you like terracotta landscapes, you've come to the right place. The city of Petra is a marvel of the ancient world. Located in Jordan's desert, the city was a commercial hub back in the 4th century BCE. The Nabataeans, an Arab Bedouin tribe, lived in the so-called Rose City and thrived for many years, having accumulated a significant amount of wealth. The city was known for its innovative water management system, which made the region inhabitable. And yes, you'll catch a glimpse of its ruins on your tour. The rock-carved gate-like structure Petra is famous for what is called the Pharaoh's Treasury. It stands at the main entrance to the site and is said to have a treasure hidden beneath it. Don't forget to stand right beneath it and take one of those classic pictures for social media. Once Petra has been ticked off the list, you fly to Southern Europe, more specifically to the tip of the Italian boot. You have a day trip scheduled to visit the ruins of Pompeii. Pompeii can be reached by car from the city of Naples. It's home to the eerie yet well-preserved ruins of a city that was once engulfed by lava. When Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 CE, it left the city of Pompeii completely buried under millions of tons of volcanic ash. The ancient city was first discovered by beneath the volcanic rock in the 16th century, but it was first cleared from debris in the 1870s. Today, you'll be able to walk down the streets of these ancient Roman ruins and imagine what the town looked like in its heyday. Pompeii was a vibrant and rich municipality. The site's ruins revealed that many areas of Pompeii had boasted impressive bakeries, markets, and even houses with balconies, which were a sign of great wealth at the time. And believe it or not, even some artworks survived the eruption. Archaeologists found well-preserved frescoes in murals with mythological creatures. All this indicates that members of the high society lived there. The city even had thermal baths and showers made from luxurious materials. While you're still in Europe, you'll hop over to visit the iconic Stonehenge. It's a perfect day trip if you stay in the city of London, just a short train journey away. Stonehenge dots the Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire, England, and is one of the world's most recognized ancient ruins. More than 5,000 years old, these curious stone rings are some of the oldest stone structures on the planet. Created out of sandstone, they are shrouded in misery. Who built them and why is still largely unknown. Popular theories claim that Stonehenge was used as a great solar calendar, built to help people keep track of days, weeks, and months. Hmm, talk about hard work to create a mere calendar, huh? 
In the final leg of your trip will take you to explore the Southern Americas. In Guatemala, in Central America, you'll find ancient Mayan ruins. The lost city of Tikal is a city made of 3,000 buildings, the remains of the capital of the Mayan Empire. You can compare its importance to such cities as London or New York today. The North Acropolis is Tikal's most ancient complex of monuments. Built solely by human hands in 350 BCE, it served as the resting place of kings and chiefs. Back in the day, the steppe pyramid temples were painted a beautiful red. Mayans loved that color. Today, of course, you'll only see the limestone. You might wonder what made such a great city turn into ruins. Well, archaeologists have no clue about the cause of Tikal's decline until today. This question remains unanswered. Was it a drought? Disease? Maybe we'll never know. Are you in the mood for some Mayan ruins? Chichen Itza is an archaeological site with the best preserved pyramids on Earth. Located in Mexico's Yucatan state, this Mayan city is well over 1,500 years old. At its peak, it was home to 35,000 people. The site covers 1.9 square miles and has many ruins spread throughout it. The highlight is El Castilla, a tremendous step temple rising 80 feet above the ground. Its most peculiar feature is that it has 91 steps on each of its four sides, including the upper platform, which makes for 365 steps, the same as the number of days in the solar year. Phew, what an intense trip. Time to head home now and soak it all in. See you next time. Behind those huge steel doors is one of the most guarded places on Earth. It's known as Site R, or the Raven Rock Mountain Complex. You'll find it in Pennsylvania. The construction is 60 stories underground and is said to be a safe place for people in case of a natural or human-made disaster. There's not a lot of information online about this mysterious place, but what we do know is that it's equipped with 38 communication systems. It's obviously not available for visits via Google Earth, but you can catch a quick glance at the two gates that face the complex. Vatican City is one of the most famous enclaves on Earth, and it's certainly worth a visit due to its wonderful architecture and vast list of art pieces to check out. One place, however, will always be off limits for visitors, the Vatican Secret Archives. They have some of the oldest and rarest books on Earth. These archives are available only to a limited number of people, and since they have been visited by a small number of people so far, they also trigger a lot of weird theories. For example, that there may be books proving there's life outside our planet. If you're fascinated by shipwrecks, you'll be interested to know that one of the largest wrecks you can see on Google Earth is on North Sentinel Island, India. It used to be called the SS Jassim. It was a Bolivian ferry that sank in the area back in 2003. The reason why people can't visit it physically isn't because of the ship itself, but because the island is home to the world's most dangerous tribe. We don't really know how many people live there, but it was estimated that between 50 to 400 people call this place home, and they really don't like tourists. No person that tried to reach them survived. Also, to protect them, their privacy, and their special status, the island is closely monitored by the Indian authorities. That's mostly because it's believed the locals don't have any immunity to modern diseases. So being in contact with foreigners might be dangerous for the tribe's people since they've never seen the outer world. A huge pink bunny appeared seemingly out of nowhere in the Italian Coletto Fava Mountains back in 2005. Besides the locals, some people stumbled upon it online too. They were puzzled by the discovery. Unfortunately, that 200-foot tall bunny is completely gone today. You can still find the images of it online though. The unusual object was designed by artists from Vienna. They encourage tourists to climb, jump, or even take a nap on top of the large rabbit. The whole purpose of the project was to allow people to experience what it would be like to live as smaller creatures. The bunny didn't have any removal date at the time it was placed there and was expected to last at least until 2025. But Mother Nature had other plans. A Japanese artist decided to move back to her little home village named Nagoro. But she soon found out that most of her neighbors were moving to bigger cities. To deal with loneliness, she started putting together scarecrow-like dolls, or kakashi, and placing them all over her garden. She didn't stop there, though. 
The artist soon began doing the same with many other places in her village, creating dolls and placing them as if they were taking part in various human activities. These dolls keep moving around too, but the woman likes to stay true to her story and insists she doesn't touch them. You can see the images of this quirky village on Google Maps. This weird portal was discovered via online maps in New Baltimore, New York. It gave people all sorts of bad dreams. With spooky-looking buildings and all sorts of blurry figures, this area soon became a source for many weird internet theories. Turns out it was nothing more than a technical issue, which resulted in those images being rendered in a distorted manner. Either way, if you look for these images on Google, you won't be able to unsee them. This cute miniature world map was created by an artist from Denmark. He continuously worked on this tedious project from 1944 until 1967, using mostly his hands and just a few tools for moving heavy rocks around. He gathered stones at the edge of the water, then recreated the map of the world on the surface of this lake. During the winter, he was able to use a sled to transport larger pieces of rock over the ice and then place them in the perfect position. Apart from the continents themselves, the map also features rivers and lakes, as well as some other famous landmarks. Care to have a look at a sea without any coasts? Search for the Sargasso Sea. You'll find it in the northern Atlantic Ocean. This weird sea is surrounded by four ocean currents and no dry land at all. It got its name from the seaweed that grows there, Sargasso. Fingerprints on the lens of a satellite camera? You may be tricked into thinking this if you search for the finger maze. It's located in the city of Brighton, UK, and is a large fingerprint created in Hove Park. It also has a maze at the center. It can be really hard and time-consuming to look for wild animals on Google Earth, but the Geo Browser does have a nice feature that can help if you're eager to see hippos and flamingos in their natural habitat. Try Googling animals from above and start scrolling through these images. This unique feature can take you from Kenya to Namibia and even all the way to Antarctica, where you can see emperor penguins. There are some places on Google Maps that, for specific reasons, aren't available for the online public, like the Royal Palace in Amsterdam. If you head over there via Google Earth, you'll see that everything around the Dutch Royal Palace is still visible, like the vegetation and roads, but the construction itself is blurred from all angles. That's probably because local authorities want to keep the unique views of the palace for the eyes of physical visitors only. The same goes for the Tantaco National Park in Chile. This one is a privately owned nature reserve that can only be seen on Google Maps from a distance. Once you reach a certain point, the zoom feature stops working. Some people say that since it's a nature preserve, it may be home to some endangered species and extreme measures are taken for their protection. You know how a certain brand of fried chicken has a certain kernel on their logo? Yeah, you won't see any of these logos in high resolution on Google Maps. That's because the online map uses specific algorithms to detect people's faces and blur them out. As you can see, it's not always really that accurate. It's called Snake Island, and the Brazilian authorities prohibit people from visiting it. For good reason. You'll find the island near the city of Sao Paulo in Brazil. It's said to be home to over 4,000 snakes. Some of the most venomous types of reptiles on Earth call this place home. If that's not creepy enough, how about that some of them are so dangerous that a small drop of their venom can permanently damage the human skin? You can see the shape of the island on Google Earth, but the more you zoom in, the blurrier it becomes. Here's another cool thing you can do on Google Earth. Time travel. Well, at least sort of. You won't be able to travel back in time and tell yourself to study more for that tricky exam. But you can see certain historical images of places you like. You can check if this feature works by looking at the upper left corner of the screen. If you can see a small icon with a clock, it may allow you to scroll some years back. But you can also see how sunlight affects Earth if you turn on the sunlight feature. From thousands of dollars worth of treasure to brand new phones and ancient cities. Let's dive into the water and see what we can find. Imagine going to the river to enjoy a boat ride. Who wouldn't want to take a couple of pics to make the memories of this trip last forever? Oops, the water splash. Luckily, you've taken precautions and put your gadget in a waterproof bag. But what if you drop your phone to the bottom of the lake along with this case? This is what happened to some people. A scuba diver and a YouTuber dived into a river popular with tourists and lost some of their gear worth $20,000.
including new iPhones and some jewelry. Oops. You might be familiar with the image of a car getting pulled out of the water, either from the movies or TV news. Large cargo vessels sometimes sink, and trucks inside them go along. That's what happened with the Thistlegorm wreck. It sunk in 1941 in the Red Sea, and these Bedford trucks were inside. Want to see something more valuable, like treasure? A British cargo ship was carrying a heavy load of silver ingots, but the vessel sank. Treasure seekers knew there was silver on the ship. Since the 1940s, they've been looking for it. The Odyssey Marine team got lucky. They made the discovery in 2011. The treasure was more than 14,000 feet below the surface. The ship had carried more than 110 tons of silver ingots. Finders keepers! The Odyssey team kept 80% of the treasure and gave 20% to Her Majesty's Treasury. Of course, there were more items on the ship, like letters, teapots, and silk sheets. You can see them in the exhibition called Voices from the Deep at London's Postal Museum. Now how about some underwater art? Sure, here you go! Polynesian Moai statues. These statues have been discovered in several areas across the world. For instance, Easter Island is full of different size statues, but many of them can also be found in Cancun, Isla Mueras, and Punta Nizu, Mexico. Seeing full-body statues from thousands of years ago under the water would probably be a lifetime experience. Gold coins are also popular items found in shipwrecks. Many divers come across coins worth a lot of money. But there's one diver in Florida who truly hit the jackpot. In 2015, they stumbled upon nearly $1 million worth of treasure. The discovery was 51 gold coins, 40 feet of ornate gold chains, and a rare coin that was made for Philip V, the King of Spain. They were once frightening and dangerous, and they still look spooky. Yo-ho! I'm talking about pirate ships! One pirate shipwreck from the 18th century was excavated off the coast of Colombia in 2015. The treasure found there was worth between 4 and 17 billion dollars. It contained precious stones, gold, and many other items. The next one is an underwater city. Neapolis is a city washed away by a tsunami. It was built on the coast of North Africa nearly 1,700 years ago. Divers uncovered the city's remains in 2017. Researchers have also discovered Roman columns, as well as household goods and tools. Now, let's go all the way back to 1503. Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama was fighting a storm when he lost his ship Esmeralda. The ship was discovered in 1998, but it had to wait for more than a decade to be excavated. Researchers found navigational tools there. They didn't have as much value as Spanish gold, but they were historical treasures. Now, in Amsterdam, they fish for bikes in canals. One third of working Amsterdammers cycle to work. Others use their bikes for different purposes, like exercising, going shopping, and so on. There are more bikes in Amsterdam than permanent residents. Unfortunately, many bicycles and even some cars end up in Amsterdam's canals. The fact that Amsterdam has 165 canals with a combined length of 60 miles doesn't make the authorities' job easier. Obviously, the owners don't throw their bikes into the water. Bikes can end up in the canals because of strong winds, vandalism, theft, or by accident. Every year, authorities fish up between 12,000 and 15,000 bikes. Our next one is a lost city. Heraklion was ancient Egypt's gateway to the Mediterranean. It became submerged and hidden under the sand. This city was famous. Maybe you've even heard about it. It was mentioned in the legend about Helen from Sparta and Paris from Troy. So how was this ancient city discovered? In the early 2000s, a team of divers found a huge fragment of rock on the seabed and took it up to dry land. It turned out that it was a piece of the statue of Hapi, who was the lord of the river of ancient Egyptians. The team continued searching and found six other pieces. 
Around them, they saw temple ruins, pieces of pottery, jewelry, coins, oil lamps, and so on. Even an old copy of the New York Times. Nah, not really. Granada Underwater Sculpture Park is the world's first, what else, underwater sculpture park. Why is this park so special, besides being located in the beautiful waters of the Caribbean? You can see the park on a snorkeling or scuba diving trip. The sculptures are about 9 to 16 feet underwater. The atmosphere and the experience itself make it special. The sculptures are made from concrete and steel. Some of them weigh as much as 15 tons. They're covered with underwater creatures. The statues were put there to help protect reefs, maintain the health of the ecosystem, and restore underwater life in that area. Now, submarines are designed to go underwater, so maybe you wouldn't expect to see them on this list. But submarines do, in fact, sink. Divers have discovered many submarines. For instance, an Australian submarine was found off the coast of Papua New Guinea more than a century after it had sunk. Now here's another submerged city, but this one was left underwater on purpose. You can see the ancient ruins of Lion City in a lake in China. This lake was created in 1959, when the valley, at the base of Five Lions Mountain, was flooded to create a hydroelectric power station. The 1,400-year-old city, now ruins, got submerged by this flow and stayed this way for over 50 years. It lay untouched at the bottom of the lake until its exploration started in 2001. Divers found out that many structures, carvings, guardian lions, and arches were still preserved. Researchers mapped and documented Lion City. They also looked for a way to protect these structures from further damage. In 2011, the city was announced to be an historic relic under protection. When you see the ruins of Lion City for the first time, the view will take your breath away. So don't forget to hold your breath. Imagine swimming in the dark waters. As you're approaching the city, you see its huge walls and extensive carvings. Marvelous, isn't it? The Cancun Underwater Museum is probably the largest museum of its kind in the whole world. It wasn't lost, per se, but now it's home to an aquatic ecosystem. Who wouldn't want to combine scuba diving and snorkeling with a visit to a world-class garden with 500 sculptures? Placed 30 feet under the surface, these sculptures are made from pH-neutral marine concrete so that they can stay on the ocean floor. Plus, here, the sculptures change over time, unlike in a traditional museum. That's because they become part of the underwater environment and a home to various plant and animal species. In one installation, nearly 450 life-size figurines are grouped together to hint at the harmonious coexistence of humanity. There is also the Anthropocene, which is an actual submerged Volkswagen Beetle placed by the Manchonis Reef. Okay, this is not a lost and found item, but this is just… Hey, it's a giant jellyfish and I wanted you to see it. This creature is known as the lion's mane jellyfish, and it's the largest known species of jellyfish. So, I'm happy now. And have you ever discovered anything underwater? Bright, colorful flashes of pink and green light up the sky. You're watching it from your backyard in Pennsylvania. That's not something you're used to, but it's very likely to happen more often in the near future as the northern lights are shifting south. Northern lights, or auroras, appear as a result of solar storms. The sun is a huge ball of molten gases that are constantly moving, so such storms aren't rare. Our star produces a huge amount of energy that goes our way. It travels as electrical charges at the speed of about 3 million miles per hour, no big deal. When all those tiny particles from the sun reach Earth's atmosphere, they give some of the energy to atoms and molecules in its upper layer. The atoms and molecules can't hold it and give it off as light. You can see it as spectacular auroras around the magnetic poles of the northern and southern hemispheres. If you were watching them from space, they'd look like large ovals. The brightness, colors, and shapes auroras take depend on the altitude where the lights are formed and what particles take part in the process. In the Northern Hemisphere, locations like Alaska, Canada, and much of Scandinavia normally get to see the brightest lights. 
The biggest solar storm ever was recorded in 1859, and it was so powerful that the northern lights were spotted in Cuba and Honolulu, and southern lights were seen as far up as Santiago, Chile. In latitudes like that of New York, people were able to read newspapers in the dark under those northern lights alone. If something similar happened today, it would have caused one to two trillion dollars in damage. With solar activity and pressure from the solar winds increasing, the Aurora Belt's borders are currently shifting south. Solar activity goes in cycles, each of them 11 years long. We're now in solar cycle 25, which started in December 2019, and will reach its maximum strength between November 2024 and March 2026. So, geomagnetic storms will become stronger and probably even reach G5 levels. Those levels are their strength ratings. For you to see the northern lights south of the Great Lakes, a storm must be rated at least G3. G5 storms will be able to produce auroras that will even reach Florida. In case you don't want to wait for the sun activity to peak in 2025, head north if you're in the northern hemisphere, or south if you're in the southern hemisphere. Auroras down there are known as the Southern Lights, or Aurora Australis. It doesn't have to be cold for you to see the Northern Lights, it just has to be dark. Auroras are active throughout the year. You can't see them from April to August in the northernmost parts of the world because it's light 24-7. It's also important that there isn't any precipitation or clouds in the sky. Those will block your view. Light pollution won't help either, so move away from any cities. Try to get to an elevation to maximize your chances of spotting the lights. They can appear in a whole variety of colors, including white-gray. The green-yellow part you're most likely to imagine while thinking of the lights is just the easiest to spot with an unaided human eye. Sometimes you might not see the lights at all, but your camera will still catch them. They might seem dangerously close to Earth, but the closest the northern lights ever get to us is 50 miles. For comparison, planes normally fly at around 6 miles above the surface, and that already seems like a lot. The distance from Earth defines the color of the auroras. When atoms giving us this spectacular show collide closer to Earth, you can see blues and violets in the sky. Green and red auroras are born further away from our planet. Earth isn't the only planet to have northern lights. Jupiter and Saturn both have strong magnetic fields, and scientists spotted auroras up there using the Hubble Space Telescope and the Cassini and Galileo spacecraft. It looks like Saturn's auroras are also caused by solar winds, but it's not so clear about Jupiter. Despite what you can often see online, the northern lights aren't going to disappear altogether. Once the sun passes its activity peak and becomes less active, both the northern and the southern lights will happen less frequently, but will still be gorgeous. Another beautiful rare phenomenon is called the green flash. It happens shortly after sunset or before sunrise when the sun is almost entirely below the horizon, and the Earth's atmosphere bends and scatters light from it. People mostly spot it over the ocean. It can also be yellow, blue, or purple. About once a year, you can spot a rare fire nado in the US. Fire tornadoes start when a strong wind picks up heat from a fire. They are made of a flame or ash. They're different from regular tornadoes because they don't start from cyclones. Fire nados are about as tall as the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Unlike fire nados, fire rainbows or rainbow clouds don't cause any damage at all as they don't have anything to do with fire. You can only see them when the sun is very high in the sky and its light is passing through ice clouds, so they're pretty rare. The rainbow halos are just as unique. Again, it takes a specific type of ice crystals in the clouds of the surface of the Earth to bend light from the sun into a perfect ring. The same thing can happen with moonlight. The only difference will be that the moon halos are usually white and sun halos can be rainbow colored. A white rainbow is another rare illusion, this time created by fog and water. Like a usual rainbow, it's formed when light is shining through droplets of water. It loses color because fog droplets are hundreds of times smaller than those of rain. A white rainbow is sometimes mistaken for a moon bow. You can spot this one at nighttime as the moon illuminates it. That's why it's not so bright. If you ever see an upside-down rainbow in the sky, that's a circumzenithal arc. 
It's not really a rainbow, but a kind of halo like those around the sun or the moon. This optical phenomenon is caused by ice crystals in the upper atmosphere. You have the best chance to see a circumzenithal arc when the sun is rather low in the sky. It happens super rarely, but it can rain without a single cloud in the sky. It's sometimes called a sun shower because it looks like the rain is falling straight from the sun. In reality, rain clouds are at a distance from that specific location. With sun rays being angled, the clouds become out of sight. Then, it takes just a little wind to blow the rain in your direction. If you ever travel to regions with high altitudes, you might see something called penitentes. Those ice spikes form only in a really cold and elevated environment where the air is dry. The sunlight turns ice directly into vapor instead of melting it into water. That's why these blades of snow and ice up to 15 feet tall start to pop up on the surface of the Earth. One of the rarest types of clouds is lenticular clouds that look like giant mountain hats. They're formed when moist air travels over a mountain or a mountain range and gets into an area of turbulence. Volcanoes can produce bolts of lightning. They're formed in columns of volcanic ash through friction and static electricity to connect the positively and negatively charged particles. To understand how it works, you can rub a balloon across your hair or your feet across a carpet and then touch a metal doorknob. Once a year, just for a few moments, a waterfall in Yosemite turns into a fireball. In winter and early spring, two streams flow down El Capitan Mountain in perfect conditions in February when the sun is hiding behind the horizon. It gets into the right position to reflect off the wall and color the water into fiery orange. All right, so let's start our journey with one of the most famous and scary vanished villages. It's located in India, the district of Rajasthan. This is Kuldara village. Unlike other abandoned places, this one is difficult to get to because the locals won't want to take you there. People are afraid of this place and try to avoid it. You can't get a taxi and drop off near this spot. The driver will tell you where to go. You won't find any traces of civilization nearby. The village is located in a hot desert area. But when you get close to it, you'll feel an unpleasant chill down your back. You won't find any vegetation because of the heat. There are only ruins of buildings and sand-covered roads. It seems as if you're walking through the excavations of an ancient city. But Koldara is not so old. It only vanished in 1825. Before this time, the village had been thriving. It was almost a town consisting of many small settlements united into communities. Residents were busy with agriculture there. Plus, they went mining and extracted valuable gypsum rocks and minerals. But suddenly, everything changed overnight. For some unknown reason, people abandoned their homes and ran away. No one knows why, and no one has ever seen the residents again. Locals living in the nearest areas are sure that this place is cursed, so they never come close to it. They think this is the center of power from the other world. Some people feel sick here, others claim to see phantoms, and still others experience irrational fear. But tourists like to go there. The simplest and least scary vision says that people left the village because of the lack of water. Still, this version seems weird. If there had been a lack of water, people would have planned the change of location instead of running away in a hurry. The second version is way more mystical. There's a legend that one cruel ruler collected large taxes from this community. He fell in love with the daughter of the Koldara chief and threatened that he would collect higher taxes if the girl refused to marry him. He gave her one day to make a decision. None of the residents agreed with such a requirement. As a sign of solidarity, they decided to leave the village. Those who don't believe in all these rumors can spend a night in a tent there. Chances are, you'll hear someone screaming or feel someone walking and knocking on your tent. Nah, just kidding. Our next village is in the US, in the state of Pennsylvania. More precisely, it's not even a village, but a borough called Centralia. This place looks totally lifeless. Burnt trees, dried grass, empty buildings. Almost all the roads here have huge cracks. 
people sprinkle them with gravel to decrease the amount of thick smoke that's pouring from the ground all the time. This abandoned place has been burning for more than 50 years. No wonder this place reminds of something. The authors of the horror game Silent Hill got inspiration from this town. Centralia was a mining town with shops, cafes, libraries, and happy residents. People worked in the mines to get anthracite coal. They used one of the underground tunnels as a landfill for garbage. And then, in 1962, according to the popular version, they decided to get rid of garbage by burning it. The plan failed. As soon as the garbage caught fire, it spread throughout the mine. Then, all mining work in the town stopped because of the increased level of carbon dioxide. Residents didn't manage to extinguish the fire, and it started to spread underground throughout the whole city. Roads began to heat up. The soil became poisonous. Thick smoke slowly filled the streets. People were evacuated from this place. By 1992, Centralia was completely abandoned. The town looks ominous, and some people believe it's not just because of the fire. They believe not all people managed to evacuate, and their phantoms are still walking through the burning streets, waiting for someone to finally put an end to this eternal fire. Just imagine a prosperous, beautiful village where people do agriculture on fertile land and bake delicious bread. And then, bang! Everything disappears! There were only traces on the ground and a couple of bricks left from beautiful stone houses, mills, and chapels. Huge fertile fields became abandoned, and no one knows why. Well, welcome to the English village of Gainsthorpe in Lincolnshire, or rather what's left of it. From above, you'll see earthen ramparts on the grassy field, the outlines of roads, sunken hollows, and barely distinguishable contours of the walls of houses and barns. If you come here, you may not even notice the traces of the village. It's just an unusual green field. But in the 17th century, life was thriving here. Let's try to solve this mystery. The first mention of this place dates back to 1086. I wasn't around then. Since that time, it was prospering. There were about 19 fertile fields, a chapel, a mill, a bridge, and a manor house where the lords lived. In total, there were about 25 buildings. From the records dating to the 16th century, you can find that quarries appeared in the village. That is, this place not only got wealthy, but also kept pace with progress. Then, by 1616, the village had become completely abandoned. Scientists are still looking for an answer to this question. Some believe that something terrible and mystical happened to the village. One of the main hypotheses explaining what happened is the plague. Another version is that Gainsthorpe still couldn't catch up with progress. In the 17th century, there was a transition from rural to urban life. Industrialization had begun. Many young people left their native villages to search for a better life. Some believe that groups of robbers and thieves settled in the village. They turned Gainsthorpe into their base and eventually plundered it all. The exact reason is still unknown, but the good news is that, theoretically, the village can be returned. Specialists can reconstruct the ruins and recreate agriculture. The hardest part, though, is to find funding. A similar fate befell the small village of Ackell Island in Ireland. About 40 simple houses made of clay and straw were located along the valley washed by Keem Bay. And it was just a fantastic place to live coast, mountains, crystal clear water, and rich soil. The village was founded in 1838. Now, there are several mounds of ground and small pieces of walls left of it. Locals living in neighboring settlements don't remember this village. Or maybe they know something, but don't want to say anything to anybody. Only travel writers described it in their diaries as a place of serene beauty. Now, many towns nearby still exist but why did this one disappear? An inexplicable phenomenon that sweeps entire villages off the face of the Earth? An unknown, mystical, scary force? If there is nothing fantastic about this village's disappearance, then why don't people build any new houses here? Perhaps they're afraid of something. So, the local archaeological school students decided to find the answer to this question. They started excavating the village in search of clues. 
they found out that some kind of trouble happened to this place in the middle of the 19th century. But it's not known exactly what. At that time, a terrible period of famine came. Perhaps people simply left their homeland to find food elsewhere. Anyway, work on excavation continues, and the students intend to uncover the truth. In the 20th century, more and more villages became abandoned all over the world. The main reason is the relocation of residents. Young people don't want to live away from the modern world. But older adults can't leave their native place, so they stay there as the last residents. And then, several years later, when they have uh, bought the farm, so to speak, villages get abandoned. Another problem is access to medicine. In some places, people have to drive tens and hundreds of miles to the nearest doctor. But many villages are still thriving. Some towns receive more funding and have developed agricultural businesses. Besides, not everyone likes city life. Often, city administrations specifically distribute free land to people in rural areas so that they can build houses there. Something interesting has recently happened in South Dakota. It was all over the internet, so perhaps you already know about it. In July of 2022, the sky in this state suddenly turned green. So what happened there? Was it caused by a human or by nature? Let's find out. Tuesday, July 5th, 2022. Shortly after a heavy storm, the sky over South Dakota in the U.S. was still overcast. Locals finally went outside and saw that the sky had an intense dark green hue, and they'd never seen anything like that before. People said that it looked like something straight up from science fiction, or even a horror movie. Unsurprisingly, South Dakotans immediately started spreading the news all over social media. People shared their beautiful, yet very eerie pictures on Twitter. They showed the sky over the city of Sioux Falls and a few other towns. Even though it may look like something supernatural, in reality, this is not a terrifying phenomenon at all. It's a simple play of the light and the atmosphere. Something like this happens quite rarely and usually means that really bad weather is approaching. And that's also true to what happened in South Dakota. Just before people started sharing photos, a thunderstorm swept through the town of Sioux Falls. This was confirmed by the U.S. Weather Service. This hurricane was terrible. The wind speed was about 100 miles per hour. According to the Buford scale on wind speeds, this is the fastest and most destructive storm. There are only 12 numbers on this scale, and the maximum wind strength starts at 73 miles per hour. But why isn't this all over the news then? Well, because it's kind of a usual thing for the residents. Thunderstorms occur very often in the United States, especially in the warmer months. And one out of 10 such thunderstorms can become something serious, like a tornado. This one wasn't an exception. It was the so-called Derreco storm. Derreco is very widespread and long-lived. It's actually a combination of a fast-moving group of severe thunderstorms and downpours. People often say that a Derreco is as strong as a tornado. Still, there's a difference between them. A tornado is a vortex, a rotating column of air. It's usually about 500 feet in diameter. Although sometimes its width can reach up to 2.5 miles. I don't envy those who would stumble upon that. But the main point is that they rotate. The wind moves very fast in a circle, near some invisible center. A derecho is a strong thunderstorm, or a system of strong thunderstorms with straight line winds. In other words, it doesn't spin. Instead, the derecho chooses a point somewhere and simply runs to it, like a very motivated marathon runner. If we compare a derecho to an ordinary tornado, the latter has six levels of strength, from 40 to 380 miles per hour. So a derecho is kind of like a small, average level one to two tornado. Usually its speed is within the range of 73 to 113 miles per hour. And in both cases, they can be accompanied by severe thunderstorms, lightning, and rain. But still, these are different things. A 
A storm becomes a derecho if the damage trail left by it exceeds 240 miles and if the wind speed is at least 58 miles per hour. It's quite difficult to predict. It can form even on a clear day when meteorologists don't even anticipate any storms. And then the winds appear suddenly. It's so surprising that they may even feel explosive. But the National Weather Service tries to warn people at least half an hour or an hour before this happens so that residents have time to prepare and hide. It wasn't any different this time. The storm swept through almost all of South Dakota, as well as the states of Minnesota and Iowa. The consequences were quite serious. More than 30,000 people were left without electricity. Fortunately, people were fine. That's because the locals are pretty used to derecos. However, the green sky is something different. It became a very unusual sight for the locals. Everyone was wondering why it happened. Was it a bad sign or a normal weather phenomenon? Well, to be honest, scientists don't have an exact explanation. But although there are only assumptions, they sound pretty convincing. A green sky is a very rare phenomenon. Most scientists think that this happens when a powerful storm approaches the area before sunset or sunrise. Then the sky will turn green in this area. NBC meteorologist Bill Cairns, who once faced a similar event himself, suggests that the green sky appeared because of the huge hail before the storm. First, let's talk about why the sky looks blue, or any other shade, depending on its mood. In short, the sun simultaneously carries all the rays of the color spectrum. It may seem white to us in total, but it actually has all the colors at the same time. However, these color waves all have different lengths. For example, blue rays are shorter than the other ones. They jump away from the air molecules better than the red waves, so they reach us faster. Because of this, on a regular clear day, the sky seems blue. At the same time, red and orange color waves are very long and move slower, so they're usually left behind. But when the sun goes below the horizon or rises, the rays' directions change, and these waves reach us better. It all means that even if the sunrises and sunsets seem red and orange to us, in fact, there are still blue and green waves among them but they have to bounce off something to reach us faster and become stronger than the red rays. Have you guessed what I'm getting at? This is where the water comes into play. Clouds are made up of water droplets. When they become large enough, but don't fall yet, for example, due to strong winds, they affect how the light behaves in the sky. Large, heavy storms mostly consist of water and hail and water reflects blue and green rays best of all. That's exactly the reason why the water in rivers and lakes seems bluish green to us. Although in reality, it's transparent. And yeah, algae matter too. So there are a couple of key factors why the sky may turn green. First off, the sun should be at the horizon level. Another factor is that while the storm clouds are approaching, they shouldn't cover the sky completely. There still must be a little room for the sun rays. Then, barely noticeable blue rays jump up to storm clouds. They're repelled by water droplets and hail. Mixing with the red sunset, they turn into a bright green light. And this green light is spreading all over the sky. That's why in most of these cases, when the sky turns green, people can only see it in the evenings. Yeah. It can also happen in the middle of the day. But since the conditions are already quite specific, seeing something like that during the day is even rarer. Still, if you see a green sky, you don't need to panic. It doesn't necessarily mean that a terrible storm is approaching. The chances are high though, but still, it's not a rule. It can be just heavy rain or a heavy hail. In other words, if you see a green sky, then you'd better hide and hide your car. 
However, if you were lucky enough to see the stunning sky from the comfort of your own home, it's indeed very exciting. If you get a glimpse of something like that, just know that you had a chance to experience something very rare and special. Some people said it was the most incredible thing they had ever seen. Hey, check it out! You could technically live in the Eiffel Tower if you don't mind residing in a small apartment. Gustav Eiffel designed the tower to feature a private apartment for himself right at the top of the construction. He left the place all neat and tidy with all the necessary furniture. These days, the apartment is home to two mannequins, that of Eiffel himself and his equally famous friend Thomas Edison. A sneak peek at the apartment is available for tourists who purchase a ticket to the top of the tower. If you ever pass through Trafalgar Square, you'll surely miss London's smallest police station, since it's hidden beneath a lamppost. The reason why it was placed there back in 1926 was to let police officers be close to public rallies. They happened quite a lot in that area. Some even said it used to have a direct phone line to Scotland Yard. It's now used as a cleaning station, so there isn't much to see there apart from some moths. Grand Central Station, one of New York's busiest, has a great hidden activity for travelers. There are tennis courts available in a secret space named the Annex. This area used to host a lot of different things back in the day, from a recording studio to an art gallery. These days, though, the location is known as the Vanderbilt Tennis Club and can be visited by the public. Similar to Mr. Eiffel, producer Samuel Lionel Roxy Roxafel designed a hidden apartment for himself in the Radio City Music Hall in New York City. He also asked for the apartment, now called the Roxy Suite, to be decorated in the Art Deco style. It features 20-foot-high ceilings covered in gold leaf and walls with floor-to-ceiling plush drapes. These days, only Radio City performers and VIP guests can visit the location. You might be able to rent it out, too, but they say the prices are very high. Rome's best-known symbol, the Colosseum, has secret tunnels hidden beneath its grounds. Back in the day, ancient Romans used these passageways to keep wild animals, like lions, tigers, elephants, and bears, as they were used for gladiator fights and other types of entertainment. They've been open for visitors since 2010, along with the Colosseum's plumbing system. It was quite the technological advancement for the time, featuring drinking fountains and even toilets. There are some people that have criticized the opening of these secret tunnels. They believe it might affect the building's structure, given the huge traffic of visitors. The Empire State Building is said to have 102 floors, but that's not true. It actually has a secret 103rd floor. The way to access it is through a hidden staircase located on the 102nd floor. But it's mostly available for the building's engineers and celebrities from time to time. That's not all. The 103rd floor leads to the Empire State Building's capsule. It's the building's famous dome. One of the most famous American landmarks features a mysterious hidden chamber. If current records are true, there's a secret room behind Abraham Lincoln's head from Mount Rushmore. It was meant to keep relative artifacts and documents of American history, like the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. We now know these important documents are kept in another location, and the Mount Rushmore room remains inaccessible to the public to this day. Like maybe it's a video game room for park rangers. Or not. Completed between 2550 and 2490 BCE, the Great Pyramid of Giza is the last remaining of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Constructed as a resting place for the 4th dynasty Egyptian pharaoh Khufu, it was thought to feature the Grand Gallery, the King's Chamber, and the Queen's Chamber. But that's not all. As recently, a secret room was discovered here. Dubbed the Big Void, kind of like my head, this huge space is nearly 100 feet long. Its main purpose is still up for debate, but some archaeologists believe it was used as an internal ramp to help build the massive structure. Cinderella Castle is the main attraction of Disney World in Orlando, Florida, in an area called the Magic Kingdom. It does have a hidden room of its own, dubbed the Cinderella Suite. The suite was originally intended to host Walt Disney himself and his family. He passed away in 1966, and he never got to see the final result. It was finally finished in 2006, and ever since, 
It's only been open a limited number of times and only for visitors invited by the Disney company. Grand Central isn't the only station with hidden features. Italy has its own Milano Centrale, the country's second-largest railway station. More than 320,000 passengers pass by these walls every day. But most of them never notice the closed doors on the sidewall of the station leading to the Royal Pavilion, a fashionable area designed as a waiting room for the royal family. The pavilion features two grand halls, divided into two floors, with luxurious furniture, styled marble, all decorated with royal sculptures. Now, even the Statue of Liberty has a hidden room. Try to guess where it is? It's in the torch of the statue. Now, unfortunately, it's not available to the public ever since it was completely closed back in 1916. A camera was placed here back in 2011 to allow people to enjoy live streaming of the panoramic view. A statue of Leonardo da Vinci, located at Rome's da Vinci Airport, was first unveiled back in 1960. It recently went under renovation. One of the workers made a mysterious discovery during this process. A small hole, somewhere in the middle of the statue, at about 30 feet. When it was carefully opened, two parchments were found inside. Written in classical Latin, the first document told the story of the area that now houses the airport. The other one provided a list of people who attended the inauguration of the statue. The U.S. Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. has a secret sports facility where clerks, off-duty police officers, and other Supreme Court employees can play basketball. The court, located on the top floor of the building, is obviously dubbed the highest court in the land. <laughs> Excuse me while I dribble. Disneyland's Club 33 is located in the New Orleans Square section of the theme park in Anaheim, California. This exclusive club houses only 500 members, and it was inaugurated in 1967. It aimed to entertain celebrities, politicians, and sponsors. The decorations were courtesy of Walt Disney himself and his wife. Services here come at a hefty price. Members have to pay $25,000 to join the club, and later a yearly fee of between $12,000 to $25,000. The entrance to the club was easy to miss, since it was hidden behind a doorway with a single gold plate that had the number 33 engraved on it. A makeover of the club took place in 2014. They moved the entrance to an even more secret location, but people can still see the old one in its original place. The New York City public libraries have hidden apartments, too. Employees and their families could stay in those hidden rooms that are placed above many of the public libraries. Most of them are either closets or empty rooms these days, but some of them are available to the public like those belonging to the $4.4 million renovation project of the apartment in the Washington Heights branch. It was transformed from an old, dusty, 3,750-square-foot space into a dedicated teen area and tech center that also features rooms for adult education programs. Cool! Here's a riddle. Which U.S. city is so loved that its name should be repeated twice? You guessed it. New York, New York. But the thing is, how much of New York do we really know? I'm talking about the city that lies under the city. Dare to join me on an underground tour of the Big Apple? Then grab a flashlight, it's about to get dark. We'll start in the heart of Manhattan, in the front of the Romanesque City Hall building. Believe it or not, beneath our feet lies New York's oldest subway station, known as the Old City Hall Station. It opened in 1904 on October 27th, a night of true celebration for New Yorkers. People were so excited, some of them spent the entire night riding the trains back and forth. Before this, urban dwellers moved around in carriages pulled by horses. No wonder the subway was such a hit! You might feel like a time traveler stepping inside the old City Hall station. The architecture is dazzling and one of a kind. They sure don't make subway stations like this one anymore. Fun fact, the old City Hall station would cost $6.2 million if it was built today. Back in the day, it had dozens of brass chandeliers hanging around. It was one of the few spots in town with functioning electricity. And oh, not to mention brand new multicolored tiled arches and stained glass ceilings you can still see today. Impressive, huh? 
If you decide to wander down the tracks, you might be in for a treat. Underground New York is as fascinating as the city above the ground. But one thing we usually take for granted is the behind the scenes of what the Big Apple needs to function. Down here, you might see one or two of New York's pneumatic mail tubes. These tubes were built back in the 1800s and they were operational up until the 1950s. They were responsible for distributing people's mail through different post offices. Letters flew at an impressive speed of 35 miles per hour. That's almost as fast as a professional runner. It sure sounds like a useful system, but I have to say, it feels weird imagining people's correspondence flying around 15 feet underground. Back to street level. We'll wander around fancy Lexington and Park Avenues. If you look up, you'll see the famous Waldorf Astoria five-star hotel. Many celebrities have stayed there, including John Lennon and Yoko Ono, as well as presidents such as FDR. This is why the hotel used a secret infrastructure to sneak people inside and out. Under the building, a tunnel known as Track 61 connected the Waldorf Astoria to Grand Central Station. The track was deactivated in the late 70s, but some people say Andy Warhol threw a party there in the 80s. I bet that was something. For the next part of our visit, we'll have to take the subway uptown. We'll get off at 125th Street and find ourselves on the scenic waterfront of Riverside Park. Here, you'll find abandoned tracks of an old metro line. If you follow the tracks, you'll get to an underground graffiti gallery, aka the Freedom Tunnel. The tunnel is named after a graffiti artist from the 80s, who is commonly known as Freedom. While exploring these tunnels, we'll see over 40 graffiti pieces he painted over 15 years. There are spray paints of James Dean, Mona Lisa, and even a self-portrait of Freedom himself. Moving on, let's wander around the northern part of NYC for a bit. Walking in Van Cortlandt Park will feel like hiking upstate, but believe me, you're still in the city. Along the way, you'll encounter some big ventilation towers made of stone. These towers were once part of an old New York infrastructure. They make up the remains of what used to be the Croton Aqueduct. In the 1800s, the city's water supply flowed through a 41-mile-long underground tunnel, all the way from Croton River in upstate New York to Bryant Park in midtown Manhattan. Oh yes, and I should probably tell you that Bryant Park wasn't a park. Instead, it hosted a colossal stone structure that looked pretty much like something ancient Egyptians would build. This four-acre structure served as the city's water reservoir. It even had a pathway on top so that people could enjoy a nice afternoon stroll while looking at the reservoir's crystalline water. Now, all this exploring might have made you hungry, but don't worry, our next stop includes a yummy treat. We'll have to leave Manhattan and make our way to Brooklyn. In case you didn't know, New York City is made of five boroughs, Manhattan, Queens, Bronx, Staten Island, and Brooklyn. Crown Heights, that's our stop. Would you believe me if I told you that beneath these streets lie caves full of aging cheese? How very Parisian of them. To get down there, you'll have to make your way through a century-old building that now works as an office space. Maybe wave hello to all those hard-working people and disappear in one of the stairways that will take you 30 feet below the ground. You won't need a flashlight for this one. The caves are bright and renovated and can hold up to 22,000 pounds of cheese. But hey, it might stink. That's the main reason cheesemakers decided to use underground tunnels to age cheese in the first place. After a bite or two of some delicious cheese, let's keep going. While still in Brooklyn, you might see tons of locals enjoying a sunny day in the McCarran Park pool. This pool is a huge attraction, being three times the size of an Olympic pool. As the NYC explorer you are becoming, you might even go for a swim. But hey, there's a much more interesting part to this attraction. The pool was built in the early 1900s, but it was shut down in the 50s. During this time, urban explorers discovered a network of underground tunnels right beneath the pool. And, of course, you can find a secret entrance and get a peek for yourself. There, you'll not only see the pool's filtration and heating system, but also a lot of graffiti from the time the site was abandoned. Neat! This question may sound weird, but have you ever seen a cow in New York? I sure haven't. Well, maybe there's a reason for that. 
Apparently, New York still has underground tunnels that were constructed for the transportation of cattle. Once New York started to flood with automobiles, cows became a burden for traffic. Until a 200-foot-long cow passage was built below 12th Street to transport the livestock that was ferried over from New Jersey. These days, you won't be able to visit this place in person because the tunnel was most likely destroyed. But historians found blueprints proving its existence. To add to the list, archaeologists discovered a very peculiar fossil a while back. Now, imagine peeling off the layers of the city's soil. First, at 15 inches, you'll find a layer of wires. I'm talking TV cables, electricity, and all that. Digging deeper, at 4 feet, you'll see water and sewage pipes. But then, at 15 feet down under the surface of NYC, diggers have found a fossilized shipwreck. The wreck is located right under Broad Street, where there was once shallow water. They believe the wreck dates back to the 1600s. It's 92 feet long and 25 feet wide. Oh, and that's not all. At the intersection of Bowery and Canal Street, engineers stumbled upon a room with its walls and ceiling covered in mirrors. And no one has managed to explain the existence of this bizarre place yet. Our Big Apple underground visit is coming to an end. But we sure did more than just scratch the surface on this one. Before we finish, let's enjoy the best of what NYC cuisine has to offer. A good old bagel. Who knows? Maybe next time we'll do Paris or even London. See you soon, Explorer. This hidden village is called Algashima. It's located right in the middle of a volcanic crater. You can find it to the south of Japan, in northernmost Micronesia. The story goes that a volcano erupted in the Philippine Sea in the 1780s, causing a lot of harm to a nearby community. Half of the population managed to escape the massive eruption and came back years later to rebuild their village. At the moment, about 160 people are living there peacefully, even though the volcano is still considered to be active. Huacachina in Peru lies in one of the driest climates in the world. And still, it's a beautiful town, surrounded by lush palm trees. It also has a lagoon, which is said to have special healing properties. The settlement has a little over 90 residents that manage small businesses. Most of them use sand as their primary resource. Some offer sandboarding services or even provide luxury dinners in the desert. For over 500 years, a small group of people has been living on a cliffside of a peak called the Green Mountain. It's one of the most remote places in Oman and in the whole world. The only way to reach the settlement is on foot, by mule, or by all-terrain vehicle. It's called Al Sogara, and you need to hike around 20 minutes up a steep stone staircase to get there. The village appeared back when the locals chiseled their houses into the mountain stone to protect themselves from storms and the cold. Five families of the Al Sharaki tribe still call this place home, about 25 people in total. A lot of other villages like this one can be found in the region, but Al Sogara is special because it's the only one that is still inhabited. Up until 14 years ago, there wasn't even electricity or telephone lines here. The nearest road you could drive on was nine miles away. Since there were no schools, people had to learn how to read and write at home from their elders. To this day, the villagers continue their traditional practice of building their homes by carving them directly into the mountain rock. One of the most beautiful Greek gems is Monembasia, a castle town located in southeastern Peloponnese. It was designed to be invisible from the mainland for added protection. You can only see it from the sea. And to reach it, you need to follow a narrow pathway that connects it to the mainland. That's actually how its name came into being. It translates to a single passage. Monembasia was built in the Middle Ages, exclusively carved in the mountain rock. These days, a lot of old mansions have been turned into guest houses and boutique hotels. Not only is the architecture amazing and beautifully preserved, but it's also surrounded by crystal clear waters. A town with no roads? Pack your bags for Gietorn in the Netherlands, if you don't mind traveling by boat. The town is very peaceful 
Probably because everyone here travels by canals. Even the mail gets delivered by water. Since there's no car traffic and people rarely move around, the town is really quiet. So quiet that the loudest sound one can hear is the quacking of a duck every now and then. It initially started as a movie set, but Hobbiton, in New Zealand, still exists, even after the filming of The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit was finished. Tours to the charming set town are now available. There are 44 Hobbit holes in total, though only a few of them are actually open to the public. The isolated cliffside village of Gasa Dalar in the Faroe Islands has a population of only 11 people. It's mostly known for its scenic waterfall, which falls directly into the Atlantic Ocean. You could only reach it on foot, hiking through the mountains not so long ago. However, a tunnel has been constructed recently, making the place easily accessible by car. The 1980s musical Popeye had a custom set built on Malta. It wasn't taken down after the filming had been finished. And Popeye Village is now home to groups of beautifully colored wooden buildings and a company of actors. There's a lot of fun stuff to do there, like watch theater shows, go on boat rides, visit museums, or simply explore the creative village. The oldest and most photographed village in Austria is called Hallstatt. It's a hidden European gem with beautifully preserved old buildings and a subterranean salt lake. It's also home to a museum with artifacts as old as 7,000 years and the world's oldest salt mine. Fort Bortange in the Netherlands is a small establishment shaped like a star. Creative parts aside, it was built this way for defensive purposes. It gave the guards of the fort a strategic advantage because they had a perfect 360-degree view. These days, the construction is perfectly preserved, including its old buildings, cobblestone streets, wooden windmills, and sophisticated bridges. In Morocco, there's a traditional earthen village made entirely from clay bricks. You can find it in a valley close to the Atlas Mountains, 32 miles from the capital of Morocco. Merchants who followed the Trans-Saharan trade route went through this town, carrying spices and gold. As the trade route became less and less popular, many of these fortresses were abandoned and are now preserved relics. It's one of the best places for skiing in the world, but it's still hidden from the public. No wonder the locals call it the secret side of the valley. Located in Austria, the tiny village of Barth has only a couple hundred inhabitants. Not only is it the snowiest village on Earth, but it also has access to one of the biggest ski slopes in the world. Its popularity increased a bit in 2013, when the construction of a high-speed road was completed nearby. Birano, in Italy, is one of the most colorful islands in the world. Because of its vibrant colors, it almost looks tropical. It features emerald green waters, beautiful houses, and a 17th century bell tower. Its lace-making tradition brought Leonardo da Vinci to the island back in the 1400s. He bought a piece of cloth there and later used it for the design of the famous Dome of Milan. If you have a UK passport, you must be familiar with the beautiful small town of Bybury, as its scenery is featured in your ID. It's surely one of the most charming towns in Europe, as it's made up of stone buildings standing on the River Colne. The image in the UK passports is that of Arlington Row, a line of weavers' cottages that date back to the 14th century. The town of Cooper Pedy in Australia is partially underground. It all began back in 1915, when opal deposits were found in the area. To this day, the town is still the biggest opal mine in the world. People living there figured out that it would be more comfortable for them to stick to the underground, as the temperatures outside can reach 125 degrees Fahrenheit. So, the settlement now has underground stores and galleries. Cooper Pedy is also home to the world's first four-star underground hotel. To visit the most remote location in the whole world, you'll need to prepare yourself for quite a journey. If you're traveling from the United States, for example, the easiest route is a 15-hour-long flight to Cape Town, South Africa, followed by a six-day boat ride. 
Only after that will you reach Tristan de Cunha. Or you can take a month-long cruise across the South Atlantic Ocean, whatever works better for you. Planning in advance is a must, since there are only nine boat trips to the island yearly. The island itself is just seven miles long. Sitting right in the middle of the South Atlantic Ocean, it covers a mere 37.8 square miles. The 300 residents are all farmers. They have the internet, but it's really slow. As for a phone network or a local newspaper, neither is available. The inhabitants of the island speak a dialect of English that is used by the smallest number of people in the world. Better buckle up, because you're about to explore some of the world's riskiest and nerve-wracking roads. You better pack some water and snacks, and prepare for exquisite views and extreme weather. And most importantly, no matter what you do, don't look down. Let's start with the Asian Karakoram Highway, the highest paved road in the world. It's located at 16,000 feet above sea level. It also stretches for more than 800 miles. If you're a history fan, you'll be pleased to know it follows part of the old Silk Road, an ancient trade route that connected Asia with the West. People used the road to carry goods and ideas between two great civilizations. As it splits the most mountainous region in the world, the Karakoram Highway is quite unpredictable. Rocks can often fall here, and there are also a lot of landslides, avalanches, and floods. When you take into consideration heavy snowfalls and herds of wild animals, you might decide to avoid the road altogether if you're not the most skilled driver. Not a fan of storms either? Well, you really shouldn't be here, trust me. The construction of this road began in the 1960s, and it's a popular tourist attraction these days. Given the altitude and lack of road barriers, many visitors also experience altitude sickness here, which can make driving even riskier. Meanwhile, the Dalton Highway in Alaska isn't a walk in the park either. For starters, at times it gets slippery, which can give a headache to even the most experienced of drivers. This 400-mile-long road stretches through remote forests and over the Yukon River. Since there are only three towns along the road, People who need to drive on the Dalton Highway are strongly encouraged to bring their own gear and lots of supplies. The road has a 240-mile stretch with no gas stations, restaurants, hotels, and whatnot. It's the longest stretch of road with no services in North America. What makes the highway even more difficult to travel on is that most of the road is made from gravel. In the winter, it gets even more complicated since the road becomes a lot more slippery. The North Yungus Road is thought to be the world's most dangerous. Why? Well, maybe because it's a single-lane dirt road? Hmm, most probably. It connects the cities of La Paz and Coroico, stretching along the side of the Cordillera Oriental Mountains. Should you ever feel the need to look over the edge here, you'd be astonished to see that the ground really is far away, 4,000 to 15,000 feet down. The road was built in the 1930s. Its widest part is 12 feet. With the side, people driving here often have to deal with thick fog, heavy rain, and even some loose rocks every now and then. Add limited visibility and more than 200 hairpin turns to the mix. As scary as it sounds, this famous route is still one of the most popular tourist attractions in Bolivia. Heading over to New Zealand, you're about to visit a 140-year-old unpaved road carved into the side of a mountain. It's so dangerous that you have to get a special permit to drive on it. And don't even think about renting a car, as most rental companies won't allow their vehicles to go to that area. And the standard insurance won't cover any issues you might face there. Bummer. This narrow road goes almost vertically to the Shotover River. So if you come across another vehicle on the way, you certainly won't be able to pass each other. You'll most likely need to reverse for up to 2 miles to reach a wider part of the road. Local tour operators can take visitors up the canyon if you're really eager to visit the area, and most people are. Why? Well, because this road was a popular backdrop for a lot of movies. Looking for some peace and quiet? The Canning Stock Route might just be the place for you. You won't get any views here, just a lot of dust and barely anyone around. 
Not to mention, there aren't many road signs, and it's really easy to get lost here. This completely secluded road stretches for 1150 miles. You can find it in Western Australia. You'll need three weeks to drive it from start to finish, so it's best if you book yourself some time off work if you really plan on visiting. Just don't start your journey in the summer months, as the temperatures there can be almost unbearable. Don't forget to pack plenty of food, water, and spare parts. And most importantly, don't drive alone. You'd better follow a convoy of experienced drivers. Not all of the dangerous roads in the world are located on the edges of mountains or in a desert. Some seem quite unremarkable at first glance, like Commonwealth Avenue in the Philippines. At first glance, it's a regular highway that is a mere 7.5 miles long. But it has 18 lanes and a lot of heavy traffic. It also gets flooded pretty often because of the poor drainage system. And since motorbikes and pedestrians often cross the road in the most unexpected places, whoa, a lot of accidents happen here, sometimes also because of poor visibility and excessive speed. Now, let's head to the Baybird of Road in Turkey. But you really should skip this one if you're scared of landslides or have ever experienced vertigo. This dangerous road is located on the shore of the Black Sea in the northeastern part of the country. Why is it so perilous, you might ask? Well, for starters, you won't find any protective guardrails separating the road from the abyss. Apart from the spectacular view, there's really no point in challenging yourself to go here if you're not a professional driver. The road has a total of 13 hairpin turns at a height of 5,600 to 6,700 feet above sea level, and all that on a stretch of a mere 3 miles. And the incline is also steep, up to 10%. Morocco has a scary road of its own. It's called the Tizi and Tess Pass. It's a tight, winding road that goes through the Atlas Mountains. It was constructed by blasting out mountain rocks back in the 1920s. Again, it's one of those places you should avoid if you're afraid of heights and steep roads. But if you can deal with these tough conditions, you'll be rewarded with amazing views. There are no safety barriers along the road either, so it's best to travel on it only during the day when it's light. In the winter, landslides and avalanches are a daily occurrence here. Keep that in mind if your car is not prepared for this kind of weather. The Atlantic Road in Avare, Norway, can offer you a real 3D experience. It winds through a small group of scenic islands in this northern European country. But as beautiful as it might look, it's one of Norway's most dangerous roads. Why? Well, because, at times, it makes you feel like you're on a real-life roller coaster. The road has a lot of twists and turns. You'll also need to be ready for some serious bouts of bad weather. That's probably the reason why visibility is often reduced here. More so, if you have to drive on this road on a stormy day, you'll have to deal with strong winds and huge waves. Moving on, it's often called the best road in the world by fans of driving. But in reality, it isn't for the faint-hearted either. Transfigurison is a road in Romania, and is probably the most famous one in this country. It winds through some of the highest mountains in this Eastern European country, the Fagaris Mountains. You won't be able to drive on this road from late autumn to late spring, as it's closed to the public because of frequent heavy snowfalls. Even during the summer, this road is closed from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. for additional safety. Not a fan of bears? Then you probably ought to skip this road, as bears often pop up in this location. These animals aren't dangerous if you don't interact with them, reach out, or offer them any food. Just the bare necessities. The Moai statues have been standing tall and proud for hundreds of years. Once, people put an enormous effort into carving these grand sculptures. And then, they just suddenly stopped making them. But why? Let's figure out this mystery. Easter Island, located 2,500 miles east of Tahiti, has an area of 63 square miles. To this day, it's one of the most isolated islands in the world. Once, it was covered with forests, filled with different trees and ferns. But when the first humans came to the island around 400 CE, the forest slowly began to disappear. 
and starting from 1250 CE, Moai statues began appearing all over the place. People made them from different types of rock – compressed volcanic ash, basalt, trachyte, and red scoria. As it's a volcanic island, these were all the ingredients the creators of the statues had to use. And once the builders completed their work, they covered the statues with pumice. The faces of the statues are different, but they all have distinct expressions with heavy brows and large noses. Their arms are carved into the body. Some have hats on top of their heads. There are nearly 900 statues all over the island. They differ in size. The average height is 13 feet tall, and the largest ones reach 33 feet in height and weigh up to 82 tons. Because the statues have so many different faces, there are theories that they represent and honor ancestors, chiefs, and other important people who lived on the island. But without any clear evidence, it's almost impossible to figure out the true purpose of the Moai. Once they stood beautifully along the coast, watching over people in settlements, and their backs faced toward the spirit world of the sea. When Europeans first discovered the Moai statues in the 1700s, many of them had already toppled over, and the construction of statues had stopped way earlier than that. Huge amounts of effort were put into making these things. Expert craftspeople spent a great deal of time slowly carving the statues with basic picks. A team of up to six people would work hard for an entire year to make just one statue. Then they often had to transport it to its special place on the island, as far as 11 miles. With the help of carbon dating, experts have managed to figure out that the statue started to appear in 1250 CE. And then, suddenly, in 1500 CE or so, the process just stopped. The creators of the statue just left their stone chisels where they were last used, and only a quarter of all the statues were actually placed where they were supposed to be. Half of them still remained in the quarry, while others were left on the ground mid-transit. Something happened on the island, and it caused everyone to just lose interest in the statues. There are many theories around why it could happen, and they mostly relate to deforestation. Islanders may have used wood to move the statues across the island. They possibly did this with the help of sleds and ropes, or even used logs to roll the statues or canoes to float them. The wood started to deplete eventually. Trees on the island took very long to grow, and rats ate most seeds. People had many uses for wood, and they needed it not only for practical things, but also to create other statues. Another reason why the inhabitants of the island could have stopped building the statues might be that they were busy with other projects. Specialized rock gardens were becoming more common with a growing population. They were great for the soil, keeping it warm and fertilizing it at the same time. Islanders spent much time and effort making these rock gardens, and there simply wasn't enough time to focus on building and moving the statues. Another theory suggests that what people believed in changed over time. Supposedly, the islands once saw the statues as a connection to their ancestors. After some time, though, Rituals depicting a show of strength and endurance became more widespread. And with these rituals, islanders started to carve images related to seabirds. Seabirds became the main animal on the island. People started to believe that their ancestors looked over them through birds instead of the statues. So there was no longer a reason to build the moai. Anyway, these theories might be true. But the main problem was that the small island couldn't support a growing population. What was once a lush land covered in forests quickly became a barren landscape. For the first few centuries, people relied on forest resources. But agriculture became more important sometime after 1550, when forests disappeared. Tribes that once worked together to build the fantastic monoliths focused on competing against one another instead. During this struggle for land and resources, the Moai statues were toppled over because people wanted to reduce their significance. Over the following centuries, all the statues were pushed over, but not all of them deliberately. Many fell naturally after being neglected for so long. Some even ended up in the ocean water surrounding the island. And there they sat for a while. But there was some good news for these statues. They were re-erected providing a great experience for visitors from all over the world. If you make a journey all the way to this isolated island, the first question you'll probably ask will not be how the statues were made or how they were moved. It will be, 
How on earth did anyone even make it here in the first place? It was one of the most amazing feats ever. The Polynesians sure did some pretty extraordinary things. From as early as 1500 BCE, these boat-faring people began to explore their world. They used the most advanced marine inventions of their time. They sailed across the ocean in catamarans and outrigger boats, starting in Southeast Asia and inhabiting many more places throughout the Pacific. They lived as far north as Hawaii in 900 BCE, and all the way to the south in New Zealand by 1200 BCE. And the farthest journey to the east was, of course, Easter Island. In only a few hundred years, these early sailors inhabited an area of thousands of square miles. They simply memorized where they had already been and, this way, managed to navigate the ocean. They used a wide range of techniques. They watched the sun as it rose and set during the day. Stars helped them at night. If it was overcast and sailors couldn't figure out direction visually, they used other brilliant methods. They watched the movements of ocean currents and wave patterns and paid attention to bioluminescence in the water. These patterns helped them find where specific islands were located. These seafarers even understood how islands and atolls in the distance caused air and sea interference patterns. Birds provided them with certain signs, too. Some of them migrated long distances from one island to another, which gave travelers some kind of a visual connection for their route. Other types of birds had specific feeding times. Sailors knew when and where they hunted and directed their boats depending on where these birds fed. Vikings certainly get way too much credit for their seafaring abilities. Where they used a sun compass, the early Polynesians relied purely on the knowledge of how nature itself could guide them. Their skills were so advanced that in 1769, Captain James Cook, an English explorer, even hired a Polynesian navigator because of his extensive knowledge of the seas. But even more surprising was the fact that he drew a map from memory. It covered an area that was 2,000 miles wide. In this region, there were 130 islands, and the navigator knew 74 of those islands by name. At the beginning of their voyage, Captain Cook often disregarded the navigator's advice. But toward the end of their journey, he was very impressed. He also recognized the Polynesians as possibly the most widespread nation on Earth.